Hello and welcome to the third annual Diminishing Returns Oscars episode. That's right, the Academy Awards are upon us, so here is an episode where we take a look at all the Best Picture nominees, as well as the awards in general. Do be aware that there are, in most cases, relatively minor spoilers for the following. Black Panther, Black Klansman, Bohemian Rhapsody, The Favourite, Green Book, Roma, A Star is Born, and Vice. Of those, I would say A Star is Born is the most significant. The, the rest are all very mild or they're, you know, based on real life and you should probably already know what happens. There are also spoilers for Harry and the Hendersons and Mary Queen of Scots. But it's a long one this week, so without further ado, enjoy! Hello, welcome to Diminishing Returns. Hello! <laughs> uh, Oscars. Yeah. It's an annual, annual extravaganza, blowout, bash, Oscars. Yes. Oscars. And, now, and the Diminishing Returns Oscars special is now in its third year, an annual right. event. Wow. We've done that before, we did it the last two years. I, I listened to our old Oscars episodes the other day. Mm. Last year's was a particularly right. good episode, actually, I recommend it. It's a good one, very right. funny. Yeah, although when we when I was listening to the to us talking about the films, I was like, I have no idea what won. <laughs> I actually can't remember what won. And it was um, it was shapey, the water one. Shapey wasn't it? water. I did. Yeah. I did. When we actually started talking about shape of water, I was like, yeah, I think this one won. But I, I couldn't have sworn to it. Um, so yeah, that's how much I care about the Oscars. <laughs> what about you guys? <laughs> I think last year we made a point of there not being a clear cut winner, which is quite unusual. Mm. This year is like the the most it could go one of any way, basically. It's it's like the the least obvious year I can remember in terms of figuring out who who's gonna win, what's gonna win. Yeah. Um I've even spoken to people who are adamant that Black Panther's gonna win. I mean they're wrong. Yeah. But uh <laughs> mm. you know. Um <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm Sol, by the way. Uh Alan's <laughs> been doing a bit of talking. And Hello. uh that sort of there's been a little bit of mumbling and grumbling in the background, which Ooh, was uh, grumbling. Calvin. Grumbling. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was grumbling exactly. Uh, uh, yes, hello everyone. Well, no, no, but I, I, I do think that you, what Alan was just saying about I think my disillusion, di- disillusionment with the Oscars uh, oh, yeah. just increases oh, God, yeah. year on year, and especially mm. looking at this year's. Line up. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, wow. Well, I don't yeah. know what the fuck's going on this year, I'll be honest. But, I mean, to be fair, I kind of feel like maybe it's a weak year for films to be drawn upon to nominate in the first place. Mm. If you know what I mean. I, I had quite a good time at the cinema last year, but it was a lot of big blockbuster stuff that was never going to have a snowball's chance in hell at the Oscars. Like Black Panther. Um, <laughs> I've I've enjoyed a lot of these Oscar films, but I don't know. It just it doesn't feel like the standards massively massively high this year, and it feels like they've struggled the Academy to find um, five real nominations, and mm. then you know to try and get people to watch the show, they've they've let there be eight nominations instead of cutting it down to six or five like they would have done another any other year. I mean, I'll say that um, I've only seen, in true uh, Diminishing Returns Oscars episode tradition, I've not seen all of these. I've only seen three. And I'm, <laughs> I am was sort of stunned that two of them made it through to this. And one of them, I didn't know if it was a surefire or not, but I guess we'll mm. get into that. But yeah, the, the two that I was really surprised at, I was like, oh, wow, I yeah. didn't even realise I was watching Oscar-worthy material Actually, yeah. when I was experiencing them. Well, you weren't. Well, we we've been caught out with a couple. Alan and I did a a diminisode on uh, Bohemian Rhapsody earlier this year because we figured mm-hmm. we'd never have a chance to talk about it under any other <laughs> circumstances, <laughs> yeah. and uh, then that got nominated somehow. So yeah. uh, our thoughts on that are already uh, clear, and it, they're not they're not massively positive. Um, <laughs> I like this is something that. 
uh, I mean, not, uh, at the top of the show, it's it's a landmark year, and it's the first ever time a superhero film has been nominated for Best Picture. Um, and there's been a bit of backlash against that because people are saying, you know, come on, it's it's far from the best superhero film ever made. That's ridiculous. Is it really worth a Best Picture nomination? To which I respond, have you seen Bohemian Rhapsody? <laughs> it's shit. <laughs> Black Panther's good, at least. So if we're going to complain about films being nominated, maybe, maybe Bohemian Rhapsody. Maybe. Mm. And and Black Panther wasn't directed by a rapist, so just throwing that out. That there. we know. Anyway, of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is I Brian mean... Singer a rapist now? <laughs> well, you, are you joke. He's, he's had some the, the... unsavory allegations. I know, I, but I know. I, I heard there'd been some unsavoriness, but I didn't think it had amounted to rape. I thought it was more just like he's. He's um, been one of those open secrets in Hollywood for like as long as I've been aware of. The yeah, but I know he always has like a scandals. couple of uh, you know young men hanging around him, but that's not rape, is it? It's just... Oh no, no, no! Like a lot of what a lot of what's being claimed of him is like really despicable, full blown, like overpowering people. You know, rape oh, kind of. Yeah, fair and, enough. And it sounds like he was a dick on the set of Bohemian Rhapsody, like, even leaving out his um, unsavoury personal life. It just sounds like he was a bit of a twat, really. Well, I, I think a load of allegations started coming in, and he just basically stopped turning up because otherwise he was going to get fired because of all this stuff kicking off. So, it, it, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's unusual that film has been nominated. One, because it's not very good, for the start of. Two, because of the whole thing with Brian Singer. Not just the fact that he's now tainted and so it reflects badly yeah. on that, but not, also because is it he got taken very... out and it was finished by someone else. So, you yeah. can't even clearly say, oh, it's this film or it's this film. It's like, mm. fair enough, you've not been nominated for director, but even as a best picture, that suddenly creates a question, it creates confusion. Mm. Not only is it not good, but it's not like been well received critically. It, it got pretty yeah. I mean, at best, mixed reviews. But mm. I, I I looked this up, and I, I think you've got to go all the way back to when that bizarre Tom Hanks film inexplicably got a nomination um extremely loud and incredibly close. Do you remember when that snuck mm. in somehow? Yeah. To find a film with as low a Rotten Tomatoes score as this one. Huh. Yeah. I mean, I guess that wasn't that long ago, but it, you know, you've got to go back a few, fair few years. Hmm. Um, we, we seem to be talking about Bohemian Rhapsody now. Shall we just do a... Because we've already talked about it, should we do a quick just sum up of our feelings? And we've, we'll, we'll can strike that one off the list then we've done it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Um, no, no, I haven't. No. Do you do you have any thoughts on it? Like, do you want to see it? Are you just well, sort of I, like? I, I was intrigued about it, uh, and then everyone that I was speaking to who'd seen it was saying, "Oh no, it's kind of dull. It's nothing special, really." So I was like, "Oh, I'll wait for it to come out then, Netflix or DVD or yeah. whatever." And then it got Oscar nominated, so now I'm sort of like, oh, "Well, maybe I should see it." But yeah, I've not heard a good word about it from anyone that I've spoken to, apart from the most people, I... which I understand he's yeah, yeah. nominated for. Most people I know like it. Most people I know sort of say, mm. oh, I thought it was all right. But then I think it's just, I think it's an incredibly lowest common denominator film that kind of plays to the masses who, the the finale is just a re, like 20 minute shot for shot recreation of his performance at Live Aid, Queen mm. at Live Aid. So, mm. And it's a great bit. It's a good performance. It's a great recreation yeah. of that. And, it, and it, it does leave you with this kind of uplifting feeling. That's it. I think enough people just leave the cinema on a high because of. Well, that's the thing. I don't know. Live Aid for twenty minutes and then sort of forget that the rest of the film was shit and there wasn't any story. I don't mm. want to. I don't want to leave the cinema on a high when I'm watching a film about a, a person who, who sort of slowly disintegrated to death for many years and kind <laughs> no, of. But... And but I, I want to leave the cinema. But like, Freddie Mercury's death was. It was positive in a sense that you know he. He was performing right to the end. They were trying to record as much as possible because he knew he wasn't. He was going to die. He was just trying to get as much done on tape, like before he died. And you know, he had people around him. He had people who loved him, and he'd achieved great things. Like I, I want to walk out with the cinema with that. Mm. I don't want to walk out with seeing him at his peak because that's not the full story of Freddie Mercury. If you're going to tell Freddie Mercury's story, you need to show him dying and everything that comes with that. 
But they didn't want to tell yeah. Freddie Mercury's story, did they? Like, I, from what I understand from a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff, Brian May was quite insistent that this was a film about Queen, not just Freddie well, Mercury. Well, I think this perhaps this is the problem, because Brian May wants the film to be about Queen... Mm. Everybody else wants a film about Freddie Mercury, <laughs> <laughs> but you can't. That's you can't do a real mm. film about Queen without doing Freddie Mercury's death as well. That's a huge part of Queen. Yeah, because the people he was making music with up until he died was Queen, mm. and the, and their relationship that d- developed over the years, and they always stayed close. Actually, which in this film there is the whole, a whole conflict and drama built up around the the band breaking up and him falling out with it that never happened in real life. So. Even that mm. is bullshit. Th- these guys, for all their differences, they stuck together through thick and thin. Yeah, mm. and I mean, the real Queen biopic would have been this, but then you carry on with Freddie Mercury's death, and then you just have like a really sad sort of depressing bit at the end where they go on tour with Roger Taylor and it's shit. <laughs> Blow out of Rush singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... Anyway, yeah. Uh, what, just to refresh my memory, Alan, what what did you give Bohemian Rhapsody out of ten? I think I gave it a five. I gave it a six. Okay. Because it was yeah. it was it's sort of very watchable. Very, it was just, I was going to say it's very it was, watchable. Well, but... what we said, it just sort of echoes what a lot of people said. You know, it was too sanitized. It wasn't gay enough for a start. That's for sure. Um, there's no plot know, as well. It's not... just a sequence. Yeah, it's of a events. series of sketches. Yeah. Um, mm. But you know, and that central performance is very excellent. And however they yeah. they've managed to do the the singing bits, and you know, there, there are three to do that works really nicely. There are three nominations this film deserved, and it, to be fair, it's been nominated in all those categories. And they are Rami Malek for best lead actor, best sound editing, and best sound design. And I, I I'm quite surprised uh, for whatever reason. I don't know if it reflects. I mean, we're, we're going to have to address it. The the Oscars. Uh, we we touched on it in the previous episode, but the the Oscars, the Academy, uh, widened the net of who could vote a few years ago in order to try and make their uh, films a bit more, a bit less what appeals to stuffy old white men, a bit more <laughs> you know diverse in in various ways, and it really does seem to have made a difference. Um, and one of the things that I think is quite noticeable is that. This year, it really seems like the individual categories are largely full of films that deserve to be nominated in that field. In the past, it'd be like, what are we giving everything to this year? Oh, the King's Speech? All right, King's Speech, best visual effects, best costume, best sound design. Yeah. And and this year, it's like sound design, well, no, the nominees are A Quiet Place, uh, yeah. a, you know, horror film that really deserved it. Uh Bohemian Rhapsody, or it really seems like a lot more thought has gone into that, and I don't know if that's the result of them letting more, you know, sound designers and uh, costume designers vote than before, or what? Well, it makes but... it like, yeah, I want I want the costume design award to be judged by costume designers who know what they're talking about for a start, but also the work that has to go into it. Because I don't know, I don't know what, how you do sound design something. I don't know anything about that. And I'm, I'm not even got a very good ear to listen, to watch two films and go, oh, the sound design in that was very good. Plus, you know, the little knowledge can be completely wrong, you know? It's like, it's one of those things where you might be doing an excellent job with a very difficult thing, but it doesn't seem that much on the final product, you know? Yeah. So, like, who the fuck knows? And it doesn't make any sense to just let... Well, you know how I feel about democracy. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I don't know. This is this is almost a point in the favour of democracy, isn't it? Before it was quite an exclusive little club that got to vote, whereas they've widened the net, made it more democratic, and it seems to be giving better results, I, I'd say. Mm. <laughs> All right, so uh, shall we start with... Do you want to talk about Black Klansman or Black Panther? Uh, Black Panther we can be very quick with, I guess. We've, We've already talked about this before in our end of re- year review. Yeah. 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 So, yeah so let's do little, this one again because we've little already recap. talked about it a lot. Yeah. Well, this is sort of what I was talking about there. Black Panther's been nominated in a lot of categories. And I remember watching the um, nominations being announced and thinking, oh, this is great that they're recognising it for costume and set design and original score. All these categories yeah. where it absolutely deserved a nomination. Mm. And then it got Best Picture, and that was really surprising. I, I didn't think 
I didn't think it would pull it off. But it did, you know, Marvel have been campaigning very hard for this to be nominated. There, There is an undeniable um, political boost that's, you know, uh, helping it along. And isn't that um, just shallow, like, to use yeah. such a message to promote a piece of entertainment like this? I don't know. It's, but promoting it after it's, it's deserving of it, I think. Like, it made a lot of money and it got a lot of positive reviews and whatnot, so it had its day. It's, like, re- released about a year ago now. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, I'm... I'm glad it's there. I I think it's far more deserving of a Best Picture nod than most of the films nominated this year. But I'm still kind of baffled that it that it did it. it it's you know the Oscars just don't work like that. The Oscars are weird and don't make much sense and aren't hmm. built on what's <laughs> necessarily the best film or what's um, been well received. But you know. I think there's a there's a there's a feeling that there's certain film types of films that win Oscars and it, it does feel like yeah. they're making a conscious effort to just shake things up and break that a little bit. Um yeah. you know, racial elements notwithstanding, the fact that this is a genre film, the fact that it's a superhero film, the you know, and that superhero films are no longer just empty action films. They are doing things they are having subtext. They you know, they've got deeper stuff going on. Yeah, um, and because superhero films have reached that point of evolution now, where they're they're uh, getting well better, <laughs> but they, <laughs> you know, so to speak. But they 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 are not just bang bang shoot shoot blow up things. Fly lest we forget, fly. it was it was um, the Dark Knight uh, ten years ago or so being snubbed at the Oscars mm. uh, for the reader that pretty much single-handedly caused the Oscars to go from five nominations to ten nominations in the Best Picture Mm. category. Because there's always five quote-unquote real nominations and then a few kind of honourable mention nominations, basically. Mm. And I think Black Panther is very much one of those not really competing, but being nominated as an honour kind of films. Um, But yeah, I mean, it is kind of baffling because... You know, we've had between five and ten nominations for yeah every every year since uh, two thousand and nine. So two thousand and ten's Oscars, I think, for the films of two thousand and nine, and hmm. it's taken them this long to get there. Um, I, I am convinced the Dark Knight was probably like the sixth highest voted for film in its year and just missed out. So hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a weird one. And it sets a, but I think a what you say is guess, is very but... correct. It because it creates this world, uh, the set design, the costumes, stuff like that, which is really well realized. Uh, which I will compare to, say, for example, Aquaman, which I thought was quite shit in that sense. I know you liked it, but I didn't. But the visual style of it, I I like no, I, yeah, I like the visuals and stuff. Let's don't. In case anyone hasn't heard that episode, I don't, I don't want people leaving thinking, <laughs> "Oh, Soul likes Aquaman." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. That's what I heard. Um, so because you can get all those things in, it's like, okay, that's legitimized it a little bit. So put it in for best picture won't seem so weird because it's like, look at all these cool elements it has. These very award-worthy yeah. elements. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's... But then, you know, Marvel have been putting out films receiving universal acclaim with fantastic, you know, set design and costumes and music for a while now. It's... It's interesting that this is the first the first one of the films that has actually broken through and and you know it's, a lot of superhero films have had a big campaign uh, behind them as well for best picture nod Wonder Woman had a mm. big big push from Warner mm. Brothers to be nominated for best picture uh, mm. Deadpool had a big big <laughs> push from Fox weirdly enough and really? I think it got a pre- yeah, I think it got a Producers Guild nomination as well, which is usually a hmm. an indicator of who's going to get Best Picture nomination. So hmm. it wasn't completely in vain. Um, hmm. But I think this is the first time Marvel have really, really gone for broke. And yeah, I mean, fair play to them. I mean, it's it's my second favorite film out of all these nominees. Put it that way. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I like that it's here. It's like Get Out 
I, I didn't think Get Out was the best film last year, but I was really glad that it was in the running and competing, and it was just nice for it to be there. Mm. That's yeah, kind I of mean, how I feel about it. Uh, I mean, I, I, we've talked about Black Panther on our review of the year episode, so I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail. But yeah. we, I mean, I just thought it was another superhero film. I didn't think it was anything particularly special or interesting. It was fine. Likewise, yeah, exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah, the the visualization and how that was created, it was all very impressive. Yeah, give it that. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I mean, I, I I agree. I just think I like superhero films more than you guys. So I mean, hmm. that's fine with me. Um, I can't remember what you guys gave it. I gave it an eight. I might I have given it a, it a six. I think I I gave it a six. Yeah, I think I did. It was either a six or maybe it was a seven. But yeah, one of those. I'm gonna look that up. Black Panther. You gave it a seven, Cameron. Oh, did I? Oh. So, should we talk about Black Klansman? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was surprised this one was best picture material. I enjoyed it when I saw it. When, when did it come out? Was it October last year? Something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah, it was... Um, it, it, it kind of came and wasn't really yeah, tipped passed, for passed me, boy, Oscar love me. or awards. It, it was just a kind of very well received little Spike Lee joint that had, yeah. you know, snuck up and I remember it getting very good reviews, but I didn't watch it at the time. Oh really? Yeah. Oh. What about you, Alan? <clears throat> no, I I remember hearing about it. I didn't know much about it and it passed by before I got the chance to see it or anything. I watched yeah. it the other day. Um and I kinda of went into it pretty blind because didn't really know anything about it, so I thought, right, I'll just watch it. I'll yeah. look at information or trailers or anything like that. So, you know, yeah. my first thought was, this guy sounds a lot like Denzel Washington. So, you know, he's got the exact same voice. And obviously I looked him up and so it was. But, uh, yeah, well, are we jumping straight in? What's the line it uses up front? This this spike joint is for real. It It really, like... It's it was a really ridiculous thing to start the film on. Well, that's it. I can't tell when Spike Lee's kind of being satirical, um, <laughs> yeah, this sort of thing, and you know, when he's playing up to it as to make a point. <laughs> I don't know what don't know what he's doing anymore. See, this uh, was only my second Spike Lee movie. The only other one I've seen is Inside Man, which I understand is oh, not yeah. a typical Spike Lee <laughs> joint, really. No, not really. I mean, Black Klansman isn't... Oh, right, okay then, no. right, yeah. There's a couple of elements it, in it. The ending there's... is very typical of Spike Lee. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. that was really odd. He's, not, he's, he's never really been good at nailing down endings, I must say. But uh, he does yeah. like putting people on a, a track and making them mo- <laughs> look like they're moving without walking. <laughs> he fucking loves that. Yeah. Mm. And obviously the big racial element is very Spike Lee, so mm. there's that. But I, I think this is handled in a far more mainstream... Hollywood accessible way than than uh, Spike Lee movies typically mm. are, and I say this as somebody who hasn't seen a massive amount of his films either. To be fair, so this is um, produced by Jason Blum and Jordan Peele, isn't it? Who yeah were behind Get Out. Yeah, well, Jason Blum is the the powerhouse producer behind Blumhouse, the the yes. horror uh, company primarily that do stuff like Insidious and. Uh, they rebooted yeah. Halloween, uh, but they're known for kind of schlock horror. But he's, mm. they've done, um, that's what I mean, he's, he's kind of created uh, this business model that's worked so well that it was just expanding and expanding and, you know. Well, that's mm. it. He, Something he, like, weirdly enough, I think the first bit of expansion was Whiplash that inexplicably was oh, part of Blumhouse. I didn't realise that was Blumhouse. Oh, yeah, yeah. Interesting. A very weird one that they did. And then they did Get Out, which obviously mm. uh, was sort of within that horror banner, but not quite the same beast and, and very well received and mm. critically lauded and Oscar nominated. Um and yeah, here we are with Black Klansman and and they're developing he's developing a whole load of things with Jordan Peele following up on that and <laughs> he's uh in fact I believe He's just been handed the keys to the universal dark universe, or whatever they're calling it, to try and oh. salvage that oh, wow. sinking ship. Uh, that which... makes sense. It's not like there's a yeah, lot. I'm very to, excited. There's a about lot it, to right? risk there, is there? I mean, they've pretty hmm. much given up on it already, so may as well just see if they can do something with it. 
they're making an Invisible Man movie to try and uh, rectify yeah. the the shape the whole thing's in. So. Int- mm. Not with Johnny Depp, I hope. Oh, I doubt it. Oh, good. good. I think it just sounds like they're starting from the ground up again. But yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very excited for a Jason Blum mm. horror monster movie world. So yeah, yeah. Um, oh, excellent. Yeah, it was it was odd to kind of see him pop up here, but um, it sort of made sense to a point. Mm, mm. I think it's... Spike Lee's been making very underground, low end. Like I think his last film was crowdfunded before this one. I remember you know, that. He's yeah. not really been playing in the Hollywood system. Um, I I would say since actually I was going to say since Inside Man, but he made that old boy remake, didn't he? Mm. Um, this feels like a kind of return to the mainstream. Yeah, it's um, interesting. So yeah, the film itself. So it's based on a true story. Um, now, I haven't looked into it, and you know, you always have to take that sort of thing with a pinch of salt, but there are several elements in this film that I, would just, I was thinking, no one, no professional writer would ever write this <laughs> because it's ridiculous, it's not believable, <laughs> yeah. it's stupid. Uh, so I presume a lot of that is based on truth. Um, <laughs> I, I was vaguely aware of a, a story that I assumed this was based on, but it turns out to be a completely different story that there's a guy who made a point of um uh i think he's black and he he made a point of befriending clansmen and kind of winning them over to the idea that not all black people are you know uh beneath them and that they're human beings because this one guy who's friends with them you know ends up meaning something to them and he he basically ends up getting them to leave the clan and and keeps their robes as his uh, sort of victory um, trophy. And he's got a massive amount of people to kind of leave the clan just by being nice and befriending them. And it's this really interesting... I think they've made documentaries and stuff about it. So I just assumed it was that story. Um, But no, turns out there's another black guy messing around with the clan from my limited research which is basically just going on wikipedia i read that uh i think the whole thing with the bomb was a complete uh made up element just for the movie oh really uh, and that the true That's story yeah, something cause, else happened because that felt like quite a messy element that, yeah uh i just assumed was real because of it but uh, fair enough yeah, yeah. but there's but the, the whole uh, central so concept strokes, the, the, yeah. this guy you know, this guy, he speaks on the phone to and gets an invitation to join the clan. Obviously, he's black, so he can't go, and so he sends one of the other undercover detectives in his He's a policeman, place. we should add. Yeah, 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 sorry, he's a detective. Um, and then, but then, at that point, you go, right, well, you're the undercover guy now. You can start talking to him on the phone. You can take over this investigation or whatever. <laughs> Why is he yeah. talking to him on the phone? This other guy, that, so the voices don't match. They're getting different yeah. information, having to compare. It doesn't, like, that is not a way to run an undercover investigation, it seems to me. <laughs> it was, seems like a very yeah. bad idea. It's one of those things where, like, when a film uh, promotes itself as being based on a true story, it actually gives it a lot more leeway because you yeah. The majority of the audience are not going to go and read the book on which this is based or hear the testimonials of the people involved in real life. So you just get an, a lot of, um, yeah, extra leeway to make these kind of huge jumps, I think. That's why the Coens put based on a true story at the front of yeah. Fargo, yeah, just because they <laughs> said it'll give them leeway and people will be more likely to go with a lot of the less believable elements. <laughs> it, it wasn't some clever artistic decision. It was just a kind of <laughs> mm. trick, <laughs> basically. Cast there. Johnny Johnny Washington. John David Washington. Mm. In the lead. What do we make of him? Didn't think he was very good. Uh... Um, I can't say I thought much either way. He was fine. I thought he was, yeah, I thought he was fine. I thought he was very just sort of functional. He didn't really, I didn't feel like he brought much to it, but at the same time, yeah. he didn't do anything wrong. Um, mm. And, you know, he was likable enough. Um, I I really liked Adam Driver, but I'm already a big You're fan a big Adam Driver fan already, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's nice to see him in a in a film that, 
I like. <laughs> for the only thing I've seen him in is the Star Wars things. And like, you know, who's coming out well out of those. So <laughs> yeah, seeing him doing something a bit, bit more meaty was good. I can tell that he's a good actor. I don't. This isn't the yeah. role that's going to make me think he's amazing, but I, you, mm. you know, yeah, I'd be happy to see what else he's done. That's about it, really. Isn't it? <laughs> the, no, no. Um... There's Topher Grace as David Duke. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, he was yeah. a surprising, uh, surprising turn from Topher Grace. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was, yeah. yeah, it was quite. Um, yeah, I quite enjoyed him actually. Yeah, uh, I, I also. Uh, I had no idea Steve Buscemi had a brother, but <laughs> that was yeah. I, I was like, that looks a bit like Steve Buscemi. But looks exactly not, like him. It's not like an not older him. Steve Buscemi though. But that's really <laughs> uncanny. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Who We're talking, of course, of Michael Buscemi, who's uh, who plays one of the detectives. Michael yeah. Joseph Buscemi, sorry, but yeah. Um, I'll tell you who jumped out to me as a good performance. If I can figure out what his name is, hang on a sec. Um, is it the old guy? No, no, no. Um, a guy called Corey Hawkins, who is, was in the N- NWA film. When the when the detective first goes to the Black Power like speech, and yeah. there's a guy there giving a speech. Oh, him! Oh, I thought that that speech was great. He just completely you know embodied one of those great orators who, would, who mm. automatically mm. Get, grabs your attention and and you know and and I was I was caught up in it. You know, I was like, yeah, come on. Let's go and fight mm. Whitey! Come on, yeah, um, I, yeah. It really I, got uh, me into the into that frame of mind. That is exactly what that scene should have done, and it worked beautifully. Mm. Yeah, mm. tell you what, as well, I I really loved the uh, the sort of subplot dynamic between very early off the back of that scene. They they set up Ron, uh, our protagonist, as being torn between uh, two different ideologies that both sort of want. Uh, black power, you know, equality, racial mm. equality, but there's the kind of more um, black panthery attitude of you know, rise up and we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore and blah 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 way of doing it. But then there's his way of doing it, which is I'm joining the police and I'm going to make an active difference instead of just protesting. And he he gets into a romantic mm. relationship with someone who's you know thinks all police are uh, uh, working for the man and therefore an enemy of black people. And I, I just thought it was a really nice sort of um, way of kind of having the angel and the devil on the shoulder, you know, the two different sides of the same coin being shown. Um, I thought it was a really nice the, dynamic. The, the thing is, though, he, like, yeah, we have that side of him and, and you know, he's he's going out with this girl and, and chumming up with these black power people and they're all like, fuck the police because they're racist and, you know, to yeah. be fair... It was in the, this is the seventies, and you know they they were justified in that feeling. Um, but obviously, he we established at the beginning of the film he's the first black policeman in this particular kind of area or whatever. I'm not sure exactly what what the thing was, but um, so obviously, yeah, the police are white and therefore the enemy, or whatever. So he's trying to change that from that side, yeah. But then we see him with the police, and the racism sort of within the police didn't seem that strong. The fact that yeah. he's like the only black person there, everyone's very accepting and comfortable of that. Um, well, and then they have they, like they, one they character of, who's yeah, deliberately <laughs> standing out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. obviously, he, but, uh, and like, I, I, I presume that's deliberate. They wanted to, they want to show that they're all working together. The police chief was definitely kind of passively racist, but he kind of, you know, comes round to acknowledge this is a great cop he's got on his hands who's doing great mm. work for him after he starts to prove himself um I, I thought that was actually a bit of a strength of the film that it had those well, different was... layers of racists if you will yeah. like it's not yeah. just your angry unintelligent uh, uh, unintelligent texas you know rednecks it's uh also these different people who don't on the face of it have a problem they're not going to join the Ku klux klan or anything but it's just so built into the society and i assume how they were brought up that yeah it's just so casual i i agree i i thought it was nice to have a mix there and i, I get what you're mm-hmm. saying it, it did feel perhaps a little bit sanitized but that was, i, I that thought it, it i think I it, was it showed a bit a... too much the other way yeah. but i, think I, it I agree with you of... actually i agree with what you're saying i mm. i kind of liked that it wasn't just a kind of sitcom style racism yeah, and, yeah here's and... the bad guys here's the good guys and you know we all know how we feel about it 
And, you know, we're talking about a Spike Lee film and going off his past work, this isn't <laughs> nuanced racism isn't exactly his <laughs> forte. He his his previous work that I've seen has been very um for lack of a better term, black and white in, in how it portrays this stuff and you know. Yeah, um, uh, but that's what I mean. I just mean, like, maybe it would have been nice to just have a bit more development of that, his character doing yeah. something. It, like, it, I think part part of my problem with this film in general is that I never felt very emotionally connected to it at all. And then the other characters, we don't get much yeah. backstory. We don't really get involved with them at much in a personal level. It's it's really very mm. plot-driven about this investigation. Yeah, I, and I, even, I And even Ron, agree. the main character, in like we have a love story and all this. We never really get to know anything about him. We don't get much out of him from the actor like he doesn't give much away and yeah i just never really cared really Mm. yeah i sort of agree i felt very detached from everything on an emotional level but that wasn't enough to stop me enjoying it Um, yeah no I, i agree the only times i really felt emotional i guess were when um it was the uh what what's the guy's name? Corey Hawkins, who we mm-hmm. mentioned earlier on, who was doing his speech, and then later on, ha- Harry Belafonte has a little speech yeah, that's yeah. intercut with d- different bits of the film, and those were the only bits that sort of really gripped me on an emotional level. The only bit for me was when it evoked all the uh, footage from Charlottesville and the the woman who got killed right at the end. and stuff like that at the end. Yeah, which uh, I don't think mm. that quite counts because obviously that's just. That's just sort of saying, oh yeah, remember this real life thing that happened. Oh, okay. yeah. But did, I, I think it, it, I found that so jarring, the inclusion of that real yeah, life it footage is, that yeah, it, I, it, was it didn't have the desired effect. I was sort of like, because at the end, they, the film's just sort of playing out and um, John David Washington and his girlfriend see that there's a burning cross outside, if I'm correct. It's been a while since yeah. I've seen it. And yeah, then yeah, they're yeah. sort of floating towards the window with guns in their hands. And I thought we were going to get some kind of real, you know, exploitation, cathartic. They were going to go and shoot up this Ku Klux Klan group or whatever. And we were just going to end on that sort of a note. But then it it doesn't. It just shifts to real life news footage. Huh. Um, I mean, I I just I thought it was going the other way, and it was going to end on a real kind of harrowing, sort of evoking horror kind of note. But I, mm. I, I kind of it I did it was feel like Tarantino it, with it, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I wasn't expecting a um a montage of news footage and stuff at all. No, it, it did feel very out of place. But then, as Alan says, this is a this is a Spike Lee joint. This is the sort of weird <laughs> tonal inconsistent stuff he likes to do so um mm. i mean it, it 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 it's one of those things as well where the the film already evokes a lot of contemporary issues and it, it just felt a bit like yeah i mean we get it we don't need we don't need yeah. you to kind of say this is a, a modern day analogy for um stuff that's going on here and here and but mm. This film at the end, uh, in, when it's showing this real footage, <clears throat> it, it it brings uh, it brings up the connection between David Duke, who was a once a leader of the Klan, is still yeah. you know a white supremacist kind of person. Uh, his connection to Donald Trump and connections mm. they've had, yeah. And I just think, especially um, especially something also also nominated as Vice, which we'll talk about later. You know, Vice essentially shows that a vice president of the United States in very recent years was extremely corrupt and, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, And this film pretty much flat out says the current sitting president of this country is a racist and a terrible person. (laughs) And the fact that that film's being made is not that surprising. The fact that Spike Lee's making that is not surprising. The fact that it's nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards Mm. surprises me. Or at least it's interesting to see that that sort of thing is so open and so brazen. It doesn't surprise me, I don't think. I mean, Hollywood is always, you know, going to be very liberal. Yeah. And yeah, I'm sure that half the people who go up on stage are going to make... I mean, that whole Roma film is... I've not seen it. I'm sure you guys are going to talk about it. But that's all about Mexican immigrants, isn't it? I mean, it's not... I was, Roma doesn't really engage with the Trump issue. Certainly not in a... Um in a such an overt way it's it's a lot more just about but you you can say that hollywood is so liberal blah 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 but, and yeah the actors that go up there and give speeches yeah but 
Mm. As we've said, the academy is filled with old white men, and they're the same people who vote <laughs> for the Republican Party and all this sort of thing. So, mm. yeah, I, yeah, I but they're but they're Hollywood's old white men. They they're like the liberal. Yeah, but Ronald Hollywood Reagan Hollywood. was Hollywood's old white man, you know. True. I guess so. Yeah, I guess you are. Yeah, Clint Eastwood and and yeah, yeah. I guess still. I, uh, I I don't think it's that much of a surprise, really. But I, I get what you're saying. It, it's you know, it'd I, be like having. Yeah, I mean, but I think it, I think it's interesting because it says a lot about how the 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 seat of president is respected compared to just 20 years ago or probably pre Clinton. I think. It was before yeah. That. Well, I, I I think Trump ha- has you know, firstly defiled the somewhat. The title yeah, then. exactly that. <laughs> I think a lot of his supporters would openly admit stuff like he's a liar and he you know is bad in these other ways and just don't care, um, mm. and. Yeah, I don't know, but I, I get what you're saying because I, Daniel Blake, got some BAFTA nods, but it wasn't like that film at any point had David Cameron come out and like wank off a pig and sort of <laughs> you know kick some poor people. And it, it, you know, it was a there's a there's a degree of uh, not uh, removal but uh, separation from from uh, yeah. from the two. And you're right, this this just is overtly saying. The president is evil. The current sitting president <laughs> is evil. So, but you're right. I think I think times are different now, aren't they? They've changed. So Trump's mm. uh, an anomaly. So yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, we don't have to go into it, but I did. Just the last thing I want to mention was that there are just these weird little comedy elements in this film that don't fit the tone at all, and just didn't sit right with me at all. Just I remember laughing thing. out loud. At, there's a bit where they've got David Duke on the phone and they're just taking the piss out of him. And David Duke's talking about like how, oh, I can tell you're not a black man because you pronounce your word, you would be pronouncing your words differently. I can't remember what it is. But then he does an impersonation and uh, yeah, the detective and his co-worker like laugh. And I was okay with that bit. Funny. Then they mm. do it again later on, and that bit was like, okay, you're just dragging this out now. It's, when, it's when it, yeah, I've got to admit, when it came yeah. out later on, it had a real feel of like a 1970s cop drama's closing scene before they yeah, all yeah, smile yeah. and laugh and the credits roll. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I thought I thought it worked for the most part. I mean, uh, yeah, overall, I, I quite enjoyed Black. Well, no, I, I not quite enjoyed. I, I really enjoyed this film. Um, it's one of my. Yeah, it's one of my more favourite films this year. Uh, Go on then, what did you give it? Eight out of ten. Yeah. Mm. I, it was just a Which bit is too... very generous eight, I should add. That's an extremely generous eight. It was on the it was on the border between a seven and an eight, but Well I um uh, yeah, it was a bit too nothingy for me and like not there was a bit, the tone was just too inconsistent, so but it was fine. I gave it a six. Uh seven from me. I, I enjoyed it. Uh thought it was yeah, funny in places and yeah. Is that the I same ratings it. we gave Black Panther? Mm. <laughs> Alan's the most racist out of all of us. <laughs> yeah. Him and Liam Neeson. Yeah, Alan <laughs> thinks black people are only worth six out of ten. What's that about? Yeah. Wait till we get to a star is born. <laughs> there are Absolutely no black, no people, black people in that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Calvin is no longer with us, but uh, we still have some films to talk about. Uh, Calvin's not dead, by the way. When I say no longer with us, I mean he's just uh, walked out. The favourite. Next up, the favourite. What? Your favourite of the year? Is that what you're saying, Alan? It's, well, it's the favourite. What, to win? Uh, no, it's the favourite, Saul. What? <laughs> Who, who's on first? <laughs> Our next film is The Favourite. That is a title of the film, The Favourite. No, but what's the title of the film, The Favourite Film? <laughs> it's it's The Favourite Song. No, I know it's The Favourite. <laughs> Alright, shall we move on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alright, so... that's The Favourite. <laughs> next up. <laughs> the Favourite. Um, yeah. Yor- Yorgos... Lanthimos. Yorgos Lanthimos, yes. Yorgos Lanthimos. Now, I, I haven't seen The Lobster, so yeah, yeah. You've not seen The Lobster? I haven't seen The Lobster. I have seen Dogtooth, though. See, I've not seen Dogtooth, and people always go, mate, you would, you should watch that, it's amazing. You would love, you would love Dogtooth, mate. <laughs> you would not love Dogtooth. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, 
It's filmed by Janos, Janos Lanthimos. Is it fucking mental like all his other films? Yes. <laughs> Except In the same more way. more Greek. <laughs> well, have, having seen The Favourite and The Lobster, I mean, he has a very definite style of sort of intentionally stilted kind of weird delivery. Is it like that? That's well, the difference with The Dog Tooth is also obscure in terms of plot and narrative and stuff like that. The Favourite is, on the surface... It's a period drama, um, very popular, Royals. You only need to get two minutes into the film before it's like, <laughs> this is not, <laughs> weird this is not this. A, a very normal, typical uh, period not, piece. Not this is a... Abbey, but... It's not, I don't think it's a subversion of period dramas. It's, it's because I don't think it's trying to subvert them or satirise them. I feel like it's a deliberate perversion of them. I, I don't think it's particularly... It's not like Quentin Tarantino approach of, like, I've watched loads of period dramas and I'm going to play within the context of a genre. I think it's more Yargos Lanthimos wanted to make a film that happened to be set during this period and therefore it falls into the category of a period drama by default. <laughs> That's the impression I got. Mm. Not only is it a biography, but you know it's based on, I think, very specifically uh, real life. It it's um, surprisingly uh, close to reality. Um, it is, um, but uh, in, in in one sense, there's. I mean, the the idea that they were lesbians, um, or at least having you know lesbian affairs with each other, all these characters, is. I mean, at best, a theory. Obviously, there's no yeah. there's no evidence for that. But also, it's it is a pretty classic kind of thing that people do, where it says, "Oh, look at these these women were very close, probably lesers. Yeah, they're probably lesers, right? Um, yeah, that that would be it." Hey, um, and the, there's not Abe, really Abe Lincoln was really close with this guy, so Gabe Lincoln, I call him, uh, particularly for Queen Anne, the history of Queen Anne, who has been. Really, uh, who's the one they say fucked a horse? That's not her, no, that's no, Catherine. I know, but who Catherine? That's the same sort of conjecture, that's what I'm getting exactly. At. But it's exactly the sort of thing where you, you, you want to put someone down in history and so say you make up whatever you want, uh, particularly because she was a woman and and kind of during a period where that was uh, looked down on, people will make up whatever they want, they think being a lesbian is terrible, and so they're gonna throw that at her. Oh, look, she has this strong female advisor, she's probably a leser. So I don't really like that it plays into that. I also feel like it's titillating for its own sake in this film. So basically, I didn't particularly like that element of it. I think this story would have worked just as well if they had been... um, Because it goes to such great efforts to show these sort of Machiavellian intrigue, scandal in the court, and and kind of the plans and plots, to then make it like about, oh, well, yeah, she eats my pussy better, so, you know, let's let's go with her for a bit. I think it cheapened the whole thing. And like I said, I felt it was just sort of titillating for its own sake, and a kind of like, you've never seen this in a period drama before. And other than that, it's kind of very, yeah, very factually based, and or at least you know on what we know of the time, and and certainly the people that are there, and kind of what they were doing, and where they end up is all quite real. Well, uh, how did you feel about the ending? It didn't really have one, did it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It kind of it reached a point where it couldn't really go much further, and that was that. It felt very much like right. Well, we've done that for ninety minutes. Yeah. yeah, it kind of felt like it had its hands tied there, and they were just like, right, well, I guess we'll just kind of do a little, you know, quite a subtle little "I see you for who you really are" yeah. type uh, moment. And uh, you know, I, all things considered, I, I, I like that conceptually, but I don't know if it necessarily well, felt all that. Satisfying. Perhaps the problem with that was that the reason she suddenly sees her for what she really is is a very stupid, like, obvious thing. Like, not obvious, but I mean. It's just like there's no kind of the character doesn't come round to a realization, just sees something kind of nasty, and you know, it's like killing the cat, you know, it's like, oh, we want to show this character's bad, so have them shoot the oh, dog. Kind of, but it, it's, I don't, I think it's like that's the straw that breaks the camel's well, back. I don't well, I think didn't, I didn't get it. I, I think there's an idea that she's got to point a com- to a comfortable point where she's not hiding it well anymore. I think that's yeah. more more it and she's And also worse and worse. Lady Sarah's, you know, put ideas in her head and and made her sort of consider the idea that she's not all that she claims to be. But I think I mean speaking about the direction for a while and, and cinematography particularly you know, there's some beautiful stuff in it. Obviously, they've got the costumes and the sets and all that. It'll look great. There's some really great bits that are done with candlelight that I liked. Oh, yeah, the best yeah, yeah. Bits. 
That's it, it. It reminded me um, very much of Barry Lyndon, actually. Yeah, more than, yeah, uh, <laughs> if there was a period drama, it was looking to emulate. It was that, which you know, in of itself was arguably a, a kind of period drama that didn't really abide by genre rules and conventions mm. as well. So, as a general thing, I didn't particularly like the direction in in terms of the way it was shot. I I don't think shooting yeah. everything from a low angle is particularly clever. or a fisheye lens. Yeah, fisheye lenses makes no sense. It feels very self conscious, and and there was some self conscious camera movements, which is a pet hate of mine anyway. Like you really have to be able to justify that if you're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I've seen a lot of praise for the film's cinematography, and I have to say, I, I've always been a bit like, yeah, really? It, like, it's not bad, but it's, it felt, mm. uh, it just often felt weird for weird's sake. And exactly. Not yeah. as nicely shot as, you know, a lot of other films. Um, I think I thought, it's Oscar nominated for its cinematography, isn't it? I mean, it makes sense. Uh, well, mm. I yeah. mean, the, the, the stuff that was just candlelight, it was a lot of faces on these yeah, kind of black really backgrounds nice. yeah. that I thought was beautiful, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. That That's very much the um, highlight there was, for me. There is... There's obviously a tone of humour through it, which I actually felt they managed to maintain throughout. Like, it was yes. a weird tone of humour, but it was balanced throughout, and they kept it, and I was happy with that. I mean, much like a lot of the films we've been talking about, I'd say the acting is a real highlight here. Yeah, obviously we're saving this. Uh, we we kind of not mentioned it, and it feels <laughs> like the elephant in the room. The acting, the three female leads in this film are fantastic. Mm-hmm. Olivia Coleman finally sort of breaking through to, I mean, not mainstream America, but I, I never, you know, 10 years ago, if you told me she'd be getting an Oscar nomination in her life, I, I don't think I would have believed it. Well, she, she, she's come from a comedy background, but she's never broad comedy. It was always very, like, you could tell there's proper mm. acting behind it. And I don't then... know. It was pretty broad in that Mitchell and Webb look. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. But the, my point is that I don't think it's that surprising that she can. I know, act. no, I know what you mean. I, Which, I, whereas um... when you see like Kathy Burke do serious, it's a bit more like, oh shit, where did that come from? But um, <laughs> but yeah, and and uh, she, what was the, what was that drama she did with David Tennant on the yeah, TV? Yeah, like she, that, she, she did won, Tyrannosaur. For that. And... Yeah, it's not out of nowhere. This is it, you know. Yeah, it's been a slow kind of build to it, but um... uh, so yeah, Olivia Colman plays the queen. We've got Rachel Weiss, who is her like ad- advisor, basically, and companion. I know a lot of people absolutely love her. I've never mm. really understood it um, <laughs> until now. I think this is the first time I've really seen her in something other than The Mummy, <laughs> where she's got a chance to do anything, you know? Do you know that Rachel Weiss is older than Olivia Coleman? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, because you wouldn't get because the whole point of the characters is she's older and like they're talking about when they met and she looked after her when she was a kid and stuff. And I was like, that's weird. They shouldn't look. And then I've looked them up and there she is. Rachel Weiss is forty eight. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Those two, we know they're doing well. And then you've got Emma Stone, who is, I mean, Emma Stone is just one of those people who has something. She has that kind of special magic that film stars have. And uh, I, like I'm just... really pissed off about Emma Stone, honestly. <laughs> really? Because I think I've complained about this off air, but I just, I feel like she was my own special thing that I knew <laughs> about in like 2007. And... Yeah. Yeah. As soon as I saw her in like that episode of Malcolm in the Middle or whatever it was she first did, I just thought, wow, she's brilliant. I really like her. And then now she's, you know, everything she does is getting Oscar nominated and she's one of the biggest stars in the world. And it's like, yeah. I don't want to have to share her. But yeah, I mean, Emma Stone, she's kind of can't put a foot wrong at the moment. She's she's just brilliant. I feel like Emma Stone is the the highlight of this film for me. I, I think she's incredible as ever. It's like with Philip Seymour Hoffman, you always knew he was going to do a good job, no matter what the role is. It's like some people just have that, you know. And she's she's great. Emma Stone is is completely and utterly who I'm rooting for for um, best supporting actress. Yeah. So the actors are great. Uh, Nicholas Holt, bit shit. But, oh know. no, I thought he was good. I liked him. I yeah, liked him. Not, all right, shit is strong, but it was nothing special. I really like Nicholas Holt as well, as a general rule of thumb. It's the most I've liked him in a while, because I almost feel like... He was a similar thing to Emma Stone, actually. It was like, oh, I really like this about a boy kid. <laughs> and then he's like, 
continues getting work into adulthood and it's like oh that was surprising i kind of thought you'd drop off the radar by now yeah i can't say he's proven himself to me particularly and that's it i kind of got less interested in what he was doing as time went on but no i I like this i thought this was i liked him here i liked him and i liked the interplay between him and emma stone yeah i think that's where all my laughs came from actually were the (laughs) the back and forth they had when he pushed it on the ledge (laughs) (laughs) Lady Marlborough, who is uh, a character Rachel Vice plays, at one point, like because the Abigail was the Emma Stone character, she's Abigail wins basically wins the Queen's favor, and Lady Marlborough says, "You think you've won? Like we're playing different games," and that was that was really interesting because basically the Abigail character, you know, she in real life was the Queen's favorite, and when the Queen died, she kind of retired to a country estate and sort of lived in fair comfort. And that was that. Whereas Lady Marlborough like continued to wield power, she continued to influence the the, the uh, monarchs that came after and state. She she was she died as one of the richest women in Britain. Um, you know her descendants include Winston Churchill. One of her descendants will be on the throne one day because uh, she's also uh, antecedent of Lady Diana, who uh, obviously was the mother of Prince William and Harry. Yeah, she was playing a different game and was a lot more successful in terms of actually wielding that power, using that power for what she felt was good, whereas the other one was just trying to get in because she wanted to win. These two were playing different games, and I th- that's said in the film, but I don't think it particularly comes across from the characters and like what happens in the film. It's just that one line where she says that. And it's all there, but I think, we, I think it would have been nice to see more of that, kind of the difference between what they were actually trying to do. And, and to the Queen, it didn't make any difference. But yeah, I would have liked to have seen a bit more of that. You know what I like about this film? Uh, The dresses? The sixth credited character in the credits is Wanking Man. (laughs) Really? I don't remember that character. Wanking Man. (laughs) Played by Paul Swain. Hey, it's a credit. Oh yeah, on on the chariot. Yeah, of course. That's the sort of part I'd get. <laughs> to be like, yeah, it's an extra role, but you'll be a featured extra. Do you, can you, do you mind wanking off in front of Emma Stone? I'm like, no, don't actually. I mean, I enjoy it, but I always find it so odd. This sort of film that just dips into the pool of British comedy actor for like little minor supporting roles. Whenever you're watching a film like this and it's like, oh, it's James Smith. Oh, it's Mark Gatiss. Obviously, it's filmed in Britain, I guess. I was expect- like half expecting Paul Putner to show up. <laughs> oh, that would have been great. <laughs> or um, Tony Way, our favourite. <laughs> no, he'd be pl- he'd be playing. This like, is the kind of he'd be playing the, like the a chamber boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. He's easy to cast, isn't he? Uh, yeah, rating. Uh, I gave it a 7 out of 10. I also gave it a 7 out of 10. Hmm. Uh, before we move on, just while we're here, period films about royals, can I mention I went to see Mary, Queen of Scots? No. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you have now, so you might as well talk about it. Well, the only reason I bring it up is because I have quite a few things to say about it. Because <laughs> it was quite shit. Yeah, well, I, you told me you were going to see it, and I didn't understand why. And you well, seemed... I didn't know anything about it. I saw a trailer for it. I thought, well, that would be an interesting historical thing, you know. Why Does everyone know it was going to be shit? I didn't know that. Well, yeah, I think it got fairly bad reviews. Certainly, read reviews. Un- certainly unremarkable reviews. And I just thought, oh, well, no point going to see that then. Well, I didn't read I don't read reviews. I just saw a trailer. I thought, well, some decent actors I don't, in that. I don't think I've seen the trailer. If I see a trailer and I think that looks good, I'll, I'll go and see it regardless. But that's so rarely happens <laughs> that I see a trailer and think, yeah, that looks good. I mean, it was shit. The worst thing about it, the whole thing, was it was just totally lacking in direction. Like, like, like It just felt like nothing was knew what it was doing. It was shot on digital, where it looks really shit. And you know me, I'm not someone who's bothered by visuals, but it was just because it's a period film and it's kind of epic scale, there's all these beautiful Scottish scenery, all these castles and stuff... And it's shot it's shot on cheap digital. It looks like it's shot on a DV cam. Really crap. It, yeah, it felt like watching TV. The The main actors in it... Margot Robbie's in it, isn't she? Margot Robbie doesn't really do much. There's one scene near the end where she gets to do with something, but she's actually not even in it that much. It's really all about Mary, Queen of Scots, who's played by Shersha Renan. She's doing a good oh, job, yeah. but it does feel like that character and how it's written and all that's going on there could be great. It could be a great performance. She's doing a good performance that's lacking direction. All the other roles are kind of, or most of the roles are filled up with these like British TV actors. Recognize a lot of them. Tony Way? No, Tony Way wasn't in it. But really, just 
bad performances all round, really, or just mediocre performances. But by bad people performances. I know, are you, are you are sure Tony Way wasn't in it? Oh, <laughs> burn! And like guy, um, guy, what's his name is in it. Uh, guy guy Pierce, Pierce is in it, and like totally phoning it in, just no effort. And it, it just the whole thing felt like no one cared, and no one knew what they were doing with it. It was just like someone handed them a script, and they did a perfectly good sort of read of this script. And you know that was you know just completely lacking in uh, in everything really. So yeah, it was shit. Mary Queen of Scots, one of Alan's avoids. <laughs> Avoid, yeah. avoid, avoid, avoid. Yes. Like the plague, like the plague. Uh, yes, indeed. Four out of ten, I say. Four out of ten. Fucking yeah. hell. I mean, I did, I did my best to put you off bothering with it. So I did my part. <laughs> it has been nominated for Oscars. Has it for costumes yeah, for, and for shit. makeup and costume? Yeah, 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 yeah which yeah. makes sense. And actually, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah it's Suicide Squad you got them as well. Oh, the, oh, it says here. Sorry, I was just looking it up. Margot Robbie, Best Supporting Actress, BAFTA nominee. Well, yeah, the, the BAFTAs will have gone. What? It's British. Go on then. Yeah. And hey, you know what? I I can believe Margot Robbie's good in it. No, no. Soul. What's next? Uh, Green Book. Green Book, okay, yeah. I think we're just going alphabetically now. So, yeah, is it, is it okay. Apart, well, no, not quite actually, because we started on Bohemian Rhapsody, but that was like an accident. We just yeah. <laughs> uh, Green Book. Uh, this is uh, Vigo Mortensen, uh, Mashaha Mahasha, Ali. Yeah, <laughs> I've always been able to pronounce that before. I don't know why. I didn't know. I am um, more than anything. I want to talk about the director here. I. I Honestly, right, I, I went into this film, I didn't really, I'd seen the trailer, but I hadn't seen anything about it, I hadn't read anything, I didn't know the director. I watched the entire film without knowing the director, and then it came up at the end, and I was like, really? Is that <laughs> the, the Peter Farrelly? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, yeah, what's what's that about? Yeah, it's, it's come out of nowhere, as far as I'm concerned, because what was the last thing he did? Like, It wasn't... Three Stooges, or Dumb and Dumber 2, or <laughs> exactly. something? Exactly, it was not like there's been a, a bridge here. I think he and his brother seem to have, um, I don't know if they've fallen out, but they, they've sort of separated and gone their separate ways. His brother directed or is directing Bobby. their own side project, which I don't believe has been or is being as well received. Um, and is just kind of, from what I can gather, seems to be more of the same. But Peter, yeah, he just turned around and made this drama. And and I, I knew it was him going in. I was kind of expecting a very straightforward bit of direction and this to sort of be just like a good script and that's why it was doing so well. Mm-hmm. I say this as someone who loves Dumb and Dumber um, <laughs> and it's one of his favourite, favourite films and, and I also like Kingpin and there's something about Mary and Osmosis Jones and me, myself and Irene. You know, I'm a I'm a Ferrelli fan more or less. Um, the latter day output's not that great but... Hey, I even didn't hate Dumb and Dumber 2. And uh, having said that, I, I wouldn't say any of those films are particularly well directed. Like, at best, they're competently directed. Yeah, and they, I mean, they're as good as they need to be for that, for that style, that sort of broad yeah. comedy. Yeah, exactly. And I think what's really fascinating here is the revelation that, oh, Peter Farelli clearly directs based on the needs of the project, like any good director would, and kind of dials what he's doing up and down accordingly, which is exactly the same thing we've learned from Adam McKay, whose Vice is also nominated this year, uh, yeah, but, we'll get to you know, when he made The Big Short a few mm-hmm. years ago, having only made stuff like uh, Anchorman and Talladega Nights prior to it, um... It's just an in- interesting thing to see. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about as if this is a, a, a fantastic bit of direction. I, I don't know if I noticed anything that oh, it's, stand it's, out. It's it's not, but it's it's strong direction. It's it's not. Um... It's confident. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't feel like someone messing around trying to figure out what they're doing. It feels like yeah. he knows what he's trying to do. I listened to an interview with him actually, and it it, it does seem like a lot of his traits from previous films carried over here in, in ways that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on. Um, did he did he pretend that his bell end was a belt buckle and then <laughs> ask someone to, <laughs> to to look at it? <laughs> 
Is that a specific? <laughs> yeah, I, think I, I know there are stories about him getting his knob out as a joke in the in the olden days. He said, like, oh, "I'm worried about this growth. Can you have a look at it?" And it was just his end of his knob sticking out of his like, waistband. You know, little pranks that you play on people. I don't even get away with it these days, but <laughs> I don't think there's a directly sexual element to it, unless there's something uh, something else going on. Um, uh, no, I'm I'm talking about. Um, Curating a soundtrack, for example, you know, Dumb and Dumber's got one of the best soundtracks of the 90s mm-hmm. um, in that, you know, collection of songs that have been sort of discovered and slapped on a CD kind of way. This is much the same, but with obviously a very different type of music. I think a lot of, of how he approached uh, working with actors, again, was very similar from listening to it. I don't know, it's just interesting to see how all the skills kind of mm. carry over. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the guy's been a director for decades. It's not like he's yeah. coming out of nowhere. But, but yeah, I mean, I, what in terms of the direction, what I particularly liked about the film is uh, the performances from the actors. Like, obviously mm. they're good actors, we know that. But these feel like uh, well-directed performances as well. Yeah, I mean, the acting is, I would say, the, the strongest aspect of this film. And the, and the whole thing, just the tone of it, it feels like it knows what it what it where it's at and knows what it's doing. Mm, uh, mm. And that generally that comes from a director who's knows yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Mahashala Ali mm-hmm. is um, sort of. I think he's the guy being championed as the um, the highlight of the film. Uh, um, well, I, I, well, can I can I bring up actually? Because my first thought about this. Is this a story about racism in the 60s, but seen through the eyes of a white man, because that's the only way we can kind of assimilate it? Is that what we're doing still? Which I think is kind of not really the done thing anymore. Actually, now I've, having seen it, it's it's not quite... I think there is an element of that, but it, it's not quite that. And if I've got one complaint about this film, it's that it, it's I'm not quite sure whose story this is. And and I think ultimately it's supposed to be a the story of them together as a partnership and their friendship, in which case it feels a little bit unbalanced because we're really following the Viggo Mortensen character. We see all of his home life. Oh, he's in fact, completely, we, yeah. we see everything from his perspective until right at the very end when the Mahashala Ali character, we see him on his own. But that's the only time we ever see things from his perspective that the Viggo Mortensen character doesn't see. So yeah. that, I I didn't like that we just suddenly changed that at the end. I didn't. I, I felt like we should have had more of a balance between the two of them. Having yeah. said that, the the white guy I can't remember the character's name Tony Lip right Tony he's, Lip he's hey um, oh he, oh that's a reference for about half an hour to an hour later into this podcast depending <laughs> on how it goes um yeah so he's a credited writer on the script although I think he's dead now uh, the other guy isn't so I think that's perhaps why we're seeing it from his point of view because it's kind of he's the one who's obviously like told these guys the story so that they could write it up but yeah that would have been a slightly different having said that I I did like the fact that we were seeing it from his point of view because then things would happen to Shirley Dr. Shirley and we'd kind of come up, come into it halfway through. So he'd be getting arrested for something or he'd be in a bar and all that. And I think that created the necessary sort of suspense drama that it required. Mm. So, you know, perhaps a necessary dramatic reason for it. But that was my one kind of complaint that that felt a little bit unbalanced. And I felt like we were trying to tell both stories, but then not one of them as much as the other, you know? No, I, I kind of get what you're saying, yeah. Um, and and I agree, It's it, it really does feel like cookie-cutter Oscar bait throwback to the 90s yeah. white people and black people learn to get along kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I, I, mean. I think it's a very good example of that, all things <clears throat> considered. It's not, you know, it, it, it's not forging new ground and therefore I don't think it's going to be regarded as an all-time classic that we um, no, I can't see it, refer no. back to in, you know, a decade from now. But that's okay. Not every film has to be, um, you know, there, there's room for the, the hidden figures out there. Tonally, I think this is very similar to. But yeah, uh, uh, what I was about to start saying before is that people are kind of touting up, or at least my perspective was that people are touting up Mahashala. Mahashala Ali as the real kind of, you know, tour de force performance on show here. Um, for my money, Viggo Mortensen is the the best performance in this. He's the guy I really, really enjoyed. Um, I thought um, Mahashala yeah. Ali was good, uh, very good. Did a lot of um, stuff that was very subtle, 
um, from kind of listening to the production, and you can see see it on show. There's a lot of um, shaping the character, and I think a lot of that fed into the writing, like you know, lines being altered mm-hmm. on set and that sort of thing to better suit his perspective of who this character was. And I, I think a lot of that comes across very well. But I I thought Viggo Mortensen was phenomenal, actually. Um, I thought he was really great. One of my favourite performances this year, in fact. Yeah, I, I I kind of agree. I think both performances are good uh, and appropriate for the thing. Yeah, I think perhaps the character that uh, for Doctor Shirley that Mahashal Ali does. Uh, he is a doctor, Alan. Yeah, doctor of music. And don't call him Shirley. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, I think. I think what he's asked to do is not particularly demanding. Like, I think if we saw the character from his perspective, it would be required to do a lot more. Do you know what I mean? And I think we don't, because of what I mentioned earlier, that we we kind of come into the middle of a lot of things, I think we don't see a lot. Uh, And in that sense, I think that Mahash Ali Ali does not, is not required to do as much and therefore, you know, he does what he needs to do, but that's that. Whereas Viggo Mm. Mortensen is a bit more rounded, um, it is one of those great performances that is just like there's nothing particularly exceptional here. It's just a really good, solid performance, and it's, yeah. and you know it's something that will translate to another performance and another character. You know, you know he's one of those actors who will just bring it and bring it and bring it rather than oh this guy's just found his perfect part. You know. Yeah, I I think he's been getting a bit of criticism for doing a weak accent. Oh, really? So I'm told. But that's it. To my ear, it sounded it New sounded York, perfect, Italian, spot American, on, and. Yeah. And uh, as I think this podcast has proven out, I've got a pitch perfect ear <laughs> when it comes to Italian Americans. Hey, <laughs> hey, it's me, Cubby Broccoli over here. Hey, yes. oh, <laughs> so uh, I think I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. And I, I thought his accent was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think anything of it. it sounds like that to me. I mean, he is from New York, isn't he? It's not like he's got that element of it. So I guess. Uh, we've also got honourable mention, Linda Cardellini. Oh, is that the wife? Uh, that's that is the wife. Yes. Yeah, she was fine. I like Linda Cardellini. Do you know <laughs> who she is, Alan? Uh, oh right. If, if you've got some connection, I'm I'm more a fan of her popping up because I've seen her in stuff. To be honest, than okay, anything what, else. What, what do you know her from? There's two notable. Uh, well, I know she's she's in Freaks and Geeks. She's like the okay. the probably the closest thing to a protagonist that the show has. And so off the back of that, she's had a lot of pretty cool, you know, nerd credibility roles. One of which was when she got cast. At, well, this this isn't very credible, but she she did play Velma in the, the Scooby Doo live action movies. Oh really? She played Velma very well, in fact. You know, she okay. she really she was to Velma what Matt Lillard was to Shaggy, oh, but nice. uh, people people like Shaggy more. So you know. Yeah. Anyway, um, Green Book. Okay, right? yeah. So. I mean, just I mean, the, what I've said previously may give you a clue that I actually really like this film, and it's it's similar in kind of how we were talking about Stan and Ollie recently. It just yeah, it just that, felt that nails it. Was it was just yeah. nice. There was it was that is exactly it. Yeah, I nothing about this film is particularly remarkable. Like I say, it's mm. just really pleasant and light and enjoyable and positive. That was and the thing. and posit- That's the thing. Hopeful that there's a bit towards the end. Um, that I think really sums this up, and it's you know it's it's kind of predictable, it's kind of trite, but it just it works so well, and it mm-hmm. really did just make me feel warm and happy. Yeah. And that that's when they're pulled over by, as has happened previously in the film, they're pulled over by a policeman. They deal with these racist cops or racist laws that the police are enforcing to do with black people being having a curfew on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and you think, oh god, this again? They're driving home for Christmas. They're going to be pulled over by another racist cop, and the policeman just sort of goes, "So uh, I notice you you wheel there. It looks like it's um, looks like you got a flat tire. Do you, do you want a hand uh, changing it and helps him in the snow and just sort of treats them like equals? And it is such a nice little yeah. All things considered, very subtle moment that like you, within a film like this, you'd kind of expect something bigger than that you know well that was that was exactly my point actually because it's such a small little thing and it, i mean not subtle is the wrong word it isn't subtle but it's small it's... yeah but this was it i really liked in this film that nothing much happened it was it was 
I was waiting for this big thing to occur, like some big thing that was going to light the touch paper, and I really didn't want it to. And it, and they kept getting into these situations where it was like it could be, and then it's just sort of gets diffused. Yeah. It becomes, yeah. and yeah. it's very kind of it's like okay, that chapter, that's that chapter. And now we've moved on to the next thing, and they grow as they go along. They kind of get to know each other, and they they kind of learn about each other. And the whole thing is about the whole thing is about identity. You know, who do you identify with? This guy's black, yeah. but he doesn't really fit in with that black world that everybody thinks of uh this guy's white but he's also poor trash so he's uh, working class like the black people so he feels more attuned to them that kind of thing and uh, so that's good because you've got kind of both sides there and it's all about that and it's a kind of a discussion of that rather than any real solid answers which yeah. i like yeah. Um, but yeah, I was always waiting for this big thing to happen that was going to kind of create a plot or something, and it never quite happens. And and and, and like there are some things that could result in big things, and and it yeah. kind of never falls into that trap of trying to make it too plot driven, which I mm. think is just perfect. But yeah, um, I, mean, I really like that. Obviously, what they're dealing with the story here is you know racism in the sixties in America. It's 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 just by its nature is a very negative thing. And they and it manages to come out feeling very positive and optimistic and hopeful for the future and yeah yeah I like and that. and you know to say where we are in society at the minute and to say this is up against films like Black Klansman and stuff like that which I would say is a very negative film really well exactly Black Klan literally at the end of Black Klansman it says and it's all still the same <laughs> so, <laughs> as it was in the seventies that's it like Black Klansman kind of leaves you feel feeling shitty about things and this is like like you say hopeful for the future and I think I think there's room for both you know I think it's oh absolutely you do need a, absolutely a slap in the face to say hey look what's going on i think being cynical and downbeat is the easier option at the moment and it's kind of nice to have this as a bit of counter programming and amongst um a lot of negativity and and you know like you say that's not to say there shouldn't be any negative stuff at all because um we're, we're going to talk about a film that's very negative <laughs> in a bit um i also um, gonna stand by, so yeah. i also didn't know that this was based on a true story until right at the end where yeah, you get no, the same kind here. of hey and look what happened to them afterwards I did. I did say that the Tony character was accredited. Well, the the guy's based on was accredited writer. It's actually Nick Vallelonga who's accredited writer. I'm guessing maybe his son or something. So that that was obviously the sort of second hand perspective they were working from. But yeah, basically, I really liked this film. I gave it an eight out of ten. Uh, yeah, I I'll join you with that. I gave it an eight out of ten as well. Mm. That means this could easily end up being our highest rated film of the year. <laughs> could be. Could be. We'll see. <laughs> Of Out of the Oscar movie. noms, yeah. yeah. Uh, right, so should we move on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Roma. Okay, Roma. Roma. Now, I have a question r- straight r- off the bat. R- r- fre- fre- fresh, Roma. Yeah, I have a question straight Rewind. off the bat for you, right? Can you tell me what it is that I'm supposed to like about Roma? Uh, beautiful cinematography. Mm-hmm. Anything else? The acting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... It is uh, a milestone in Oscar nominating shit, similar to Black Panther, in that now a Netflix original has uh, finally stepped up to the plate, and that's it's not a of... Netflix original, is it? They just got the distribution on it. I don't think they make. They didn't make it. It's a Netflix original in that it went straight to Netflix, which is um, quite a um, yeah. It's a game changer. Netflix have been pushing for this for for ages to get you know award credibility for their films and yeah did you like it i want to get this out of the way straight away did you like it um this is probably my least favorite film of all the nominations (laughs) this year oh no no i like it more than bohemian rhapsody (laughs) um i mean basically i didn't like the film i liked bits of it I felt like there was quite a good 40-minute film here. Yeah, um, I agree. In fact, in fact, I'll go as far as say there's an excellent um, 40 I minutes I completely here. agree. I mean, it's, it sounds like we're going to be parroting the opinion of everyone I've spoken to and, and what seems to be the kind of mainstream opinion, which is just this film is arbitrarily slow. Like, oh, fucking hell. just pointlessly slow. Pointlessly I, I mean, slow down. Oh, ponderous for the, no reason. The opening credits is just like a slushing water for six or seven minutes. I knew I was in trouble. And you know what? I was all right with that. Like, I can deal with that up front. Oh, but yeah. if that's going to be the whole fucking film... Yeah, yeah. basically this is a, a plot that's just dragged out far too much. There's way too many tangential elements. 
that aren't justified, even like on an artistic yes. level, even if you want to kind of go, oh, yeah. it's like watching a fucking Fellini film. It's like, get to the point, because <laughs> I can't be bothered. <laughs> I like that you just, you just insulted the film with something that, if it were written down and read back in print, would be a glowing compliment. <laughs> yeah. Well, but this it's is like it. a fucking Fellini film. <laughs> if Tarantino said it, <laughs> um, there's some great moments in it. What well, there was a few shots that looked fantastic. Obviously, you got Alfonso Cuarón. He, he loves kind of impossible cinematography almost I guess is is the best way to describe it he loves doing shots that you just think how the fuck are they filming this he loves long shots loves long takes and I really like the naturalistic style of it you know I love nat- yeah, naturalism no, I, I like I, social same. realism and same. coupling this kind of quite beautiful cinematography with that is actually quite unusual social realism generally yeah. comes rough and ready it was black and white for no arbitrary reason um, that was annoying okay what I really liked about it let's do positives that childbirth bit, the whole birth scene, that was worth the price of admission alone for me. But that that scene will stick with me. That's one of those scenes that I would, I would cite as a classic bit of cinema. Mm. It really justified why it was a long take because it was just kind of, yeah. you see this person, you see everything that's going on in the background with this baby. Uh, it was very kind of flat and unemotional kind of, but in a deliberate way. It was showing like the disconnect of the these sort of surgeons with this very emotional... Um, story that of the particular person that we're following. So yeah, I like that bit. There's a lot of individual scenes I really liked, and bits of you know, personality that came through. I loved, for example, the scene at the start when the dad's trying to park his car in the, <laughs> the narrow driveway, and you know, I didn't mind how long it went on for. I, well, but... it annoyed me, because it felt like it was being filmed like a Hitchcock thing. Like, like if he touches the wall, it'll explode. Um... Yeah, it, it's like it had a sense of humor that wasn't present in in a lot of the rest of the film. And I can't say I particularly liked it. It really paid off later when you see the wife drunkenly yeah, driving it in, yeah. smashing it into the wall. I love that as well. I love that. That was a, yeah. that that made it worth it for me. That payoff of that. But like that's an example of a scene I really enjoyed. And there are a few moments like that where I kind of thought, man, if the whole film would be made up of scenes like this, this would be one of my favorite films. <laughs> but. It's like a few of these little moments and some powerful, nice moments and what have you, but just it, they're adrift in a sea of just interminably yeah. slow, arbitrarily yeah. slow stuff. And that that's that's the thing. I do not mind. I do not mind a slow film when the pacing is justified, but it just never felt necessary. It just felt slow for the sake of it. The same way he said it's black and white for the sake of it. It, it doesn't... Mm. I don't know, it just felt very like... Like Alfonso Cuaron had uh, watched a load of slow films that, you know, have really meticulous pacing and are just very powerful and thought, well, those films are slow, so I guess I've got to make a slow film now. That's so. it, yeah, like he's watching Steve McQueen films. But hasn't quite figured out why those films work. Um, I mean, after after the childbirth bit, I actually sort of like, that was the first point I was like, oh, okay, I care about this character now. I'm sort of invested. I'm interested in what's going to happen. But also, like, that could just have equally as been the end of the film. Like, that kind of, this moment of tragedy. That could, that, if the film had ended there, I would have, I, I don't think I would have questioned it. I, like, it would have been, yeah, okay, that's this sort of arbitrary story we, we've decided to end there. There's very few moments that the film could have ended where I wouldn't have... <laughs> I could have believed any scene was the final scene once you get about an hour in. Yeah. yeah. It nearly started at about 40 minutes. I thought it was going to start and then kind of stopped for another 20 minutes. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I must admit, I, I, I'm with you on this. I don't understand why... Because it, it's not just that it's being well-received by critics, but it's that the critics who like it really like it. You know, mm. they're calling it an all-time masterpiece and and one of the greatest films ever, and blah 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 blah. And in a way that I don't think any other film nominated this year has. You know, it. it but then it seems very like I say, I haven't I haven't spoken to a single person who in my day to day life enjoyed this film. Bear in mind, I work with filmy people who watch lots of arty films and enjoy. Well, that's them. it. Like I mean, it's I'm... not like I I should know people who like this film. I mean, I know we watch a lot of mainstream shit on this thing, but like, let's face it, like, we're both trained in film. I've, I've got a master's degree in film theory, right? I put a film in the cinema, like, yeah, I've... If I don't get it, then who the fuck does? Like, why don't I get it? <laughs> yeah. what, what am I missing? <laughs> 
If this is a film person's film, then why don't I get it? <laughs> Even if I don't like it myself, I would normally be able to see what people are getting out of it more than I do here. And and like I I get glimpses of it. I I, oh, yeah. I just you know, it's like if I watch a film like There Will Be Blood, there are scenes in that film I love. There's elements of it that I love. But I can see how for a certain kind of person, There Will Be Blood would hold together as a, a magnificent whole, and it's just not really my kind of thing. Mm. And I just don't really see that here. It, it's, it, it just feels less... Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. I mean, it, it felt like... It felt like there was thought behind it, and like I, I, you know, Quaron's a great director. We've seen stuff he's done before, but there was just all these elements that I just, I'm not sure. I, uh, yeah, maybe they were very personal to him. I don't know. Like there was this whole thing about dog shit that was kind of ran through. That was a big mm. thing. Maybe that's something to do with the, like some memory from his childhood. I don't know. But like, dog oh shit god, you know what, thing. Alan? I have to say, there there was a scene in this film where I was like, holy shit. It like really took me back to like when I was about one in in <laughs> Mexico. Like I've, I've never oh, really? had that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. um, when she comes out of um, so when she comes out of the cinema and she's just being like ditched because she told this guy she's pregnant. There's a load of like peddlers and stuff on the street oh, yeah, yeah, behind yeah, yeah. her, and there there's this little skeleton thing mm-hmm. that this guy that's dancing and the guy. It's like this magic trick and things like that. And I was like, oh shit, I remember seeing all the that little skeleton thing being sold in parks and little things like that when I lived in Mexico. And yeah. and it's like, oh wow, that I yeah, I completely because I I'll I'll tell people one of my only memories of being in Mexico is like peddlers selling shit, and I remember like a little toy car that you blew up a balloon and it went, you know the balloon would go and like power the car along oh yeah, yeah mangoes on a stick and stuff but there were things there that was like oh I, i've seen those yeah i've just never really quite had that like as viscerally like oh god you know that takes me back and i'd forgotten that was a thing kind of reaction to something before so oh, that's interesting yes that's yeah. nice and I, and i think you know that probably says a lot about how authentic a portrait this is of a mm. of a culture that you know isn't what we're used to, I guess. Isn't what we have here. So yeah, I mean, uh, what about the acting then? Yeah, um, very, very naturalistic in yeah. that that style that the film's kind of going for, and I, I think they do a very good job of of what they're doing. No, no one in it really jumped out at me and made me think, "Wow, that is a an incredible powerhouse performance." But Which I, I think... don't think you can do in a naturalistic style sort of thing. It's it's very difficult to do that. Especially especially like this, because all the characters are quite underplayed. It's not like you've got a big kind of Daniel Blake character, you know? I think if anyone was going to do it, it would be her sort of, the guy who gets her pregnant. Yeah. And again, he's very good, but yeah, it's, it's also underplayed. And deliberately um, so. Yeah, um, yeah, and I and I think it's very good. I I do I think the acting's very good throughout. The but world. I think that's very suit. I think that's very fitting and appropriate for kind of non actors, which the lead is. Uh, obviously, the children uh, of the family all come across very naturally. I mean, they I, I don't know what their experience is as child actors, but I suspect it's, yeah, it's, yeah, they it's, were very good. It feels like this whole film was made with that in mind. It's like watching um, Shane Meadows, you know. It's like it's something like that. Mm, it's like you yeah, can, you, there's yeah. a different feel to it when it's non-actors, even if it's not bad acting. Uh, yeah, it's deliberately yeah, yeah. natural. I think it is therefore very surprising that she's been nominated for Best Actress Oscar. Yes, well, I think that was a big surprise. Doesn't really make any sense at all. Well, I, I think it's a good performance. I don't think it's a particularly excellent performance. I I think it's le- less acting than other performances are. I like it. I, I think she's a worthy performance to be there. I mean, I wouldn't personally put her up with the um, the likes of Olivia Coleman, who we were just talking about, for example. But no, I, I, I'm, I'm glad to see her nominated. I, I think it, this kind of a film, you know, a, a film not in the English language, it's very rare for them to get nominated in Best mm. Picture full yeah. stop. But it's even more rare for them to then get a look in in, in categories like, you know, directing, acting. Yeah, I do like the performance. It didn't, it didn't scream like... I know, I know what you mean. It's, it's, it's almost like the film's just kind of working to her strengths. But then, you know, the the same's absolutely true of Lady Gaga and A Star Is Born. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, fair yeah. enough. Um, the other the other woman was nominated as well. The the, the who plays the mother of the family. Yeah, she was. Yeah, best supporting that yeah. feels fairly arbitrary to be honest. She she is a she's she is an actor. Um, that feels more like what I was just saying. There's less of this year, which is just giving everyone a nomination because they're in a film that's getting nominated. Um, 
But that, like she's she's not bad in it. No, but no, she, no, no. She, nothing about her jumped out at me. Um, but then, to be honest, there's quite a bit of that in the that category this year. I think so. every year, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Just always a tough one. Did Meryl Streep and Nicole Kidman not do anything <laughs> last year? It was Aquaman. You can't, you can't get away. Oh with that. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, so as I as I say, it's my second least favorite film of the year. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot of merit within it. I think yeah. there's a lot of great stuff there. It just doesn't quite pull it all together. It's never quite the sum of its parts. I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that like I said, that that childbirth scene would, mm. uh, I would watch that again. I would cite that as a sort of an example of great filmmaking. But um... yeah, I, I, there's there's quite a few scenes I'd cite. Honestly, I, I give it five out of ten. I gave it five out of ten. Feels a shame that we haven't got a more positive voice to chuck on here, but look, just be thankful Calvin hasn't reviewed this one because <laughs> this is the sort of film that we'd probably get. <laughs> uh, let's bring Calvin back in. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, Star is Born. Oh, oh, am I back now? Hello again, Calvin. There, that's a little. That's a little line for the edit. <laughs> You mean hanging out with Judy in the uh, in the the guest room again? <laughs> Let's let Calvin lead on this one because this is the quintessential Calvin film of the Oscars. So we better let him just say his piece first. Right. I I mean I should preface this by saying I saw this film on my birthday recently. It was uh, a part of a present from my boyfriend who had uh, taken me for a massage at a lovely. Uh, spa place and uh so and i had this massage and then after that they told me that i should be careful with how much i drink because <laughs> apparently your blood is flowing or whatever i don't know yeah um, bullshit <laughs> your cheese getting out of hand don't drink too much <laughs> so <laughs> i uh, said cheese then <laughs> <laughs> that's what i thought he said but i was just going to ignore it what did he actually say your cheese she your chakras are all oh, out right. of Oh, right, yes, yes. Well, and uh, we got to the cinema, I had a glass of wine and a couple of sips did. I could feel it in me toes, that's for sure. But <laughs> we were in, in a lovely everyman cinema where, you know, where you have the sofas and you've got a little table next to you and the cushions and all this kind of stuff. I was in the perfect mood, the perfect environment to watch this film, and I loved it. I and and it let's, let's, also, let's also add that, um, how, how do you feel about Lady Gaga, Calvin? Uh, she is. Uh, You're goo goo for Gaga. Are you a little monster? Uh, I would not use that term myself, but I'm a, a level of fandom that I have a framed uh, LP of her bad romance single, um, even though I don't have an LP player. Um, yeah, I'm 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 a big fan. I own all of her albums, and she's I can't. There's no one else who I own all, all their albums or would consider going to see them live or consider flying to Las Vegas so I could <laughs> spend my 30th birthday potentially watching her. But, yeah. Anyway. No, I'm a huge fan. Huge fan. Not of her acting, though, I should point out. Yeah, like, I've seen that... her in most other things, and I thought she's been wooden and quite terrible, so I was a bit apprehensive coming into this, and I was blown away. Like, mm. certainly best leading actress material. Yeah, I'll jump in and agree with you on that. I I've seen Lady Gaga act before. It's been awful. Um, <laughs> she she uh, she managed to turn a brief cameo in in uh, Machete Kills into a noticeably bad performance. Uh, <laughs> she was probably the worst thing in American Horror Story season five, which is saying something because she was just atrocious um i've seen nothing from her to suggest she can act at all and then this film uh and and she's like really fucking good in it it's a really good bit of acting really strong performance uh it's definitely bolstered by the fact that she can sing and it's so musically mm. heavy and it's her music that she's performing but regardless it's i i think an oscar worthy performance um i think she's probably the best performance out of the ones nominated that i've i've seen actually i'm i'm rooting for her to win although i haven't seen all of them uh hmm. Hmm. so yeah i was really surprised there i don't know quite how that happened uh maybe bradley cooper's a 
phenomenal director in ways that are <laughs> not particularly apparent in the rest of the film elsewhere. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm surprised because it's his directorial debut, isn't it? He's never directed a feature film before. He's he, what he's done here is he's competently put a film together, mm, mm. and the film has obviously resonated with people and fallen into the awards circuit. And I, I get the impression that as many actors turned directors are, I think he's probably very much an actor's director. Um, his attitude seems to be higher decent actors and just kind of let them have a camera on them and what have you but I think a lot of this film's not particularly well directed um, mm. I think the, the the stuff that's well directed is the um, the scenes on stage that kind of capture the energy of, of you know a live performance but I, I think a lot of it's quite badly directed I think there's a lot of really iffy tonal issues mm. and, and bits that aren't particularly I don't know, no, nothing it's just very conventionally well, my, my, put together. Yeah, my my one of my comments was I feel like I've seen this film twelve times before. Um mm. I mean I have seen a Star is Born before but well, it is it is the fourth version of this film, isn't it? <laughs> but, but I don't mean that. I don't even mean that. I'm talking about every kind of like oh gritty on the road kind of music biopic mm. kind mm. of film, like Crazy Heart or something like that. Which is yeah. kind of like uh, even like the wrestler, you know, that kind of like not quite documentary shooting, but yeah, we're kind of doing it free and easy, and it's not it's not too sh- lit and not too really classically shot. It's it's kind of rough and ready a little bit. I uh, I kind of agree, and I also kind of feel like I I just can't believe we're still doing this in a post walk hard world. This Oscar season, it ain't easy to walk to the top of a mountain. It's a long, hard walk, but I will. Walk hard. One movie. Walk hard. Will be so much better. The 1960s are an exciting and important time. And more important. What about you, John Lennon? With meditation, there's no limit to what we can imagine. Than any other movie. Walk hard. Dad, I was just wondering if you want to have a catch. Son, this might sound a little strange, but what is your name again? Are you Danny? Douglas? Walk home! I have a problem! I have a very addictive personality! (laughs) (laughs) Well, the story is... I mean, I've never seen a previous version of A Star Is Born, but I kind of knew what the story was going to be before I sat down, and I, I think to his credit, I didn't feel like I was just going through the motions. I did. I did feel like I was going through the motions. <laughs> I've never seen any of the other versions of A Star Is Born, and I didn't really know what to expect from the story. So, mm. um, but then to be fair, I I didn't really feel like I was just going through the motions necessarily. It felt I I knew that. I mean, spoilers, I suppose, for anyone listening, because I, I am going to get into the ending on this. Uh, but mm-hmm. So I, I'd heard going in that it was a big tearjerker of a film. and uh, I cried! It, it, yeah, and I just... I, the ending pissed me off, basically. It, ru- mm. it ruined the film for me. I, I, I kind of... So, the film is... Uh, this guy meets... The, this big, successful rock star, country music star, meets... Uh, sort of a woman in a, in a <laughs> burlesque bar or whatever it is. What is she? In? It's a drag like bar. A drag yeah. bar takes a shine to her. They they fall in love. One of my issues is that I I didn't feel they had any chemistry mm-hmm. whatsoever. The two mm-hmm. of them yeah. personally. Um, mm. Well, can I can I jump in here because basically yeah. just to spell it out, I didn't like this film at all. I um, knew you wouldn't. <laughs> but and part of the problem is. What I was really surprised about, um, and what kind of just left a bad taste in my whole mouth about the whole film was just pro suicide. Uh, no, I'm all right with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, it was just a sort of general casual misogynistic flavor to this film, which, g- given the current climate, I found very unusual, and I find it very unusual that it's being celebrated. Um, and I don't know if I agree with you though. There. Um... 
Because I mean, what we can say, to, yeah, say what piece. you're citing. Well, <laughs> yeah. the entire concept of this film is this, you know, this kind of established star fancies this young woman and so like helps her with her career because she wants to fuck her, uh, and she goes along with it. And yes, they end up getting married and all that. But at no point during this film and in this relationship do you sense that this is a good relationship, this is a healthy relationship. Dare I say it, it's a bad romance. But certainly, <laughs> it is not. Ra, 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 ma, ma. At no point does this feel like a healthy relationship, but this film also does not feel like it's about, hey, look at this unhealthy relationship and we're going to look and explore how that, uh, how, how that affects people. I disagree. I, I think this is an intentional portrayal of a bad relationship. I think the film wants to come down on the side of it being an unhealthy, bad relationship. And I just think it does a very messy job of perhaps that's trying it, yeah, to show perhaps that. Perhaps that's it. But yeah, because I didn't get that at all. So it was a very it, messy it, job. It, it ultimately comes down on the side of glamorizing it, I think. But I think that's unintentional. Uh, mm. My my big issue with the film really is that um, as I was watching it, uh, and I was watching this guy be a, a toxic influence on her life and her career and dragging her down, and the two of them not having a very healthy relationship and not, you know, clearly not being quite right for one another, even though they did love each other. And that, you know, I thought that was very uh, real and very believable. But I I just, I got it into my head. Oh, I think what's going to happen here is it's going to be the heartbreaking Harry and the Hendersons ending. You've got to go back where you belong now. You've got to go. The floor. Harry, please. Please. There's no time. No, 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 don't worry about us. We'll be all right. Get out of here! Can't you see we don't want you anymore? Why can't you go back where you came from? Go. <laughs> he he breaks up with her and tells her he doesn't love her anymore to like remove himself from her life so that she can have a proper life and a career without him and and I I thought he was going to do the ultimate act of selflessness which was one final act of love to to kind of remove himself from her life and that I was gearing up I was getting emotional like the thought of that was going to make me cry and then he just goes and kills himself in the most hacky student film bullshit ending. Mm. Fucking, it was just pathetic. I couldn't believe what I was watching. And and, and like I say, it it's pro suicide, like probably unintentionally. And this is and this is another thing. I think if you're gonna if you're gonna have something where you know a character commits suicide and perhaps you think for the wrong reasons or perhaps for selfish reasons or he thinks he's doing the right thing but you know he's not. Whatever all that is. Let's explore that. Let's tell that story. But don't tack it on at the end so that the woman can cry and we can all cry in the audience and go, oh, that was a good performance. And if and if you want proof that Bradley Cooper's not directed this film particularly well, you only need to look at that final sequence with Lady Gaga performing the heartbreaking song and after, you know, he's killed himself. Because that's a perfect example of something that wasn't directed as well as it should have been. That mm. that is the that is when you want to have the Anne Hathaway and Les Misérables mm. moment, with the camera just fixed on a performance, and you just get the power of mm. that performance. But instead, the camera keeps kind of going round the back of her head. It's not quite sure where it wants to be on. Then they start cutting to flashback clips of the two of them, mm. as if like the performance wasn't enough. And I don't know, maybe Lady Gaga's performance wasn't quite strong enough to sell that moment. But I think it probably, I think it probably was. I think it just wasn't. Have her like literally on his grave, crying and singing this song. You can have a big emotional moment. She's not. She's performing. She's doing it in front of her. If you're going to be public about your grief like that then there's going to be this disconnect and I'm not going to believe it. It's because it's a performance. It is not an emotional moment. Even like I'm talking about within the character, not the actor. They had big moments as a couple together in front of a stage, in front of an, on a stage in front of an audience. So I, I, I thought that was quite poetic that she was grieving so openly in yeah, front I, of I like all these people. Yeah, I like she's grieving in a public place like that. I, I think if she'd gone and 
sung a song on his grave, that would have been a bit. Well, yeah, it might have been a bit much. But, but <laughs> what I mean is that that character, it's not a, it's not a. They were, they, they were in the it's limelight. Not a, it's not a, it's not a sad through, person though, singing a song of their love. It's a person singing a sad song, and that's the difference. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it would have been better if she kind of, you know, perform like maybe she gets the news, but then has to perform a song that isn't inherently about him and tries to keep it together because mm. she's going to go on stage and you get some of the grief through. Do you know what I mean? Uh, something a little yeah. more nuanced like that would have worked better for me. But yeah, but like I say, I, I was just I was just furious at this point that he killed himself I just thought it was pathetic <laughs> yeah I, I, I didn't like that development either I thought it was going to go down the way that you suggested Sol where he was going to leave her but uh, I was surprised actually at how sort of I, I think once she achieves the fame um, she goes a little bit I, I don't know easy going isn't the word and not wayfish but she's very accepting of a lot of stuff that he does that I can't imagine that most yeah. people would be okay with. Uh, she's never a strong character. She was never... I mean, I don't know about that. I just... I, I think never... she is at the start, but as soon as they fall in love and she becomes famous... I, yeah, and that's yeah. and that was the other thing. I never bought that they were in love. We didn't... We weren't shown anything that says these guys are really good and they're in love. Mm. Mm. And, mm. and and we, it's not even like it wasn't portrayed well. It wasn't... We weren't given that option even. Yeah, I think the idea is she's very forgiving of his flaws because they're in love. And but I think that could, I don't think I that's think that could work well. as a story. Having a story about people who are in this bad relationship, but they they just don't leave because it's love. And like I've been in that, you know, I understand that. Yeah. But I did not get that from this couple. Oh, yeah, I, I completely. And agree. That's why um, I just never got into it. I never. Got, and like to be honest, the first forty minutes of this film, I just like it was so boring. I could not. I was really, <laughs> really struggling to get through it. And it kicked in a bit later when a bit more plot happened. And yeah, it, I was, was similar, it was honestly. So bad, but... yeah. Um, and and the other thing is, I don't like Jack Bradley Cooper's character. Nothing in this film mm. endeared me to him at any moment whatsoever. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I thought def- Ali definitely... was an alright character. I, I was there was enough about her to warm me up to her, but I thought Jack was just an incredibly bland has been, and he's portrayed as a has been. That's kind of the point. But there was no, there was never any point where you kind of think, oh, this is what made him great. And even his music, like throughout. Because people have been making a huge song and dance about the fact that Bradley Cooper wrote and performs his character's music in this, and Lady Gaga writes and performs her music with the help of Mark Bronson. Um, and the thing is, Lady Gaga's music is like astoundingly to a higher quality than Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper, like, if I was to really put some effort in and sit down and write some music on a guitar, I could probably write something about on par with what Bradley Cooper does. <laughs> Lady Gaga is like an actual professional, you know, like A-list musician. And it's just like, it's a whole different level. And I get the film kind of wants you to see her as be- leaving him behind and being better than him musically in places. But it would be better if it was this kind of old versus new and there was still something about mm. what Bradley Cooper was doing. I just think musically, his stuff was shit and bland. And Well, speaking, uh, of, speaking of the music, I mean, the music did nothing for me at all. I'm not, I'm, I'm tough with music anyway, but this, it was nothing for me. But I want to ask Calvin, as a, as a Lady Gaga fan, if, <laughs> if, the, if that music and her music in there was a big part of the, the appeal for you. Oh, yes. Well, well, no, actually, you know, I hadn't heard any of the songs before I went into the into the movie, but Shallow is... A, a, I, mean, I love it. I've been listening to it almost every other day since I saw the movie. I think it's great. I cried during that scene. I was blubbering up. I was very <laughs> lightheaded from the massage Ooh. and the alcohol was taking effect, <laughs> but I, I was just, yeah, totally into it. Can I, can I jump in as a kind of mediator? Because I'm not I, I am a fan of music. I'm not a, I'm not really fussed either way with Lady Gaga, so I think I'm coming to this from an unbiased place. Hmm. Um, like I think she's she's fine. She she's very capable of doing a specific kind of music. Um, 
and I I was very impressed with her music in this film and the, yeah Shallow in particular I thought was a phenomenal song and absolutely deserves the Oscar that it's going to win for best original song can I just say oh, I yeah, don't know which player. song it is that's been nominated right? <laughs> <sighs> obviously I can't remember it now but I knew there was a nominated song in it and I was thinking when I was watching it I was it's thinking the I wonder which one it is I, wonder, I don't know what that's supposed to be I don't know what the best scene in the film is I couldn't particularly tell the songs apart until I listened to them a bit afterwards and familiarised myself, but there was one scene that stood out to me when I was watching it, and it's the one where she first goes up on stage and performs with him. Yeah. And it's 90% of the power of that sequence is down to the music, I think. And a lot of that's, Mm. yeah, she's performing... I believe she was performing that live, and it wasn't like a studio recording, and the version we've got is... You know, her doing it in that kind of filming it live kind of way and blah 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 blah. But, um. one of the biggest weapons in this film's arsenal. That, Lady Gaga, and the music. They're, they're the two things this film really has going for it. Mm. Yeah, I just, I just cry want... when she performs anyway, never mind if there's <laughs> a story around it or anything. I do want to say, though, because I have been down the film, I thought Lady Gaga was excellent. I've never seen her act in anything, so I was pretty open to whatever, and I thought she was fantastic, brilliant performance. I still can't. I still can't get my head around it. I don't know where it's come from. Because, like mm, I say, she's mm. she's. It's not like she's just been mediocre and whittled into something. She's been actively dreadful in what I've seen her do before. <laughs> and this was great. This might be my favorite performance of the entire year, male or female. Mm. Well, this I think perhaps you know she's in tune with this character. I think probably she can oh, empathize was, with a lot of it. And... It was written around her. Oh, like, there you go. They, it's they like Eminem doing 8 Mile, you know, it's like yeah, and, yeah. it can bring the best out of people. Although, yeah. you know, speaking of that, and I, um, you know, other people like Dave Chappelle gives quite a nice little performance. I was You've got fucking say that Andrew Dice Clay. Andrew <laughs> Dice Clay. <laughs> like, I wouldn't have known it was him if it wasn't for about? the voice, you know. Who's you know, that? what Andrew Dice Clay is a like a old. He was massive in the eighties, a stand-up comedian who plays this kind of character that's not really hey, him, but it's him. Hey yo, of this kind of yeah, greaser, misogynist. Jack and oh, Jill went up the hill. Right? That's guy Jack comes the down with a broken crown. Nuff said. Know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a weird... that's pretty much his whole act from the eighties. Was he just yeah? Little well, Miss Muffet sat on a tuffer <laughs> eating a curd some way. Long came a spidey, sat down beside, he said, Hey, what's in the bowl, bitch? Oh! Mm. Hey, oh, he was like Let's a go. tough guy. Not <laughs> said, don't mess with me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, really, like, massive in the 80s, he's sort of disappeared now. But A well-known sort of hack comedian, like, he's a go-to kind of punchline Nice, yeah. <laughs> Jokey, yeah, yeah. Of like but shit. I, I've never really seen him act before in that sense. Other he's than not when done he's in a his huge... character. Yeah, he's not really done mm. much acting, really. He's done a bit here and there. It's a very odd choice to pluck him out for this film. It's, yeah, it's and he's bit... he's good in it. You know, fair play to him. He's yeah. But he's also like playing against type in that sense because he's quite a very supportive and nurturing father. Where the the Andrew Dice mm. Clay character you would think is, especially with a woman with a daughter, would be very misogynistic and kind of put everyone's he puts everyone down. And so it is a weird choice. I thought he did a very good job. I, I that's what I'm saying about Bradley Cooper's direction. Maybe he's bringing good things out of people. I think Bradley right. Cooper himself in this film could have really used a director telling him, just giving <laughs> yeah. him an outside point of view. Yeah. He's a good actor. Yeah. And he gives a fine performance here, but it's not a good... Yeah. He, he's distracted, he's doing other things. I, I think put another actor in there and, and just direct them. You know, Stop trying to do it yourself. Um, and you'd be a lot better off. Um, mm. uh, Isn't it weird that Alec Baldwin has like a tiny little weird cameo in two of the films nominated for Best Picture? Well, that's what he does I can't now, remember him in um, A Star Is Born, actually. When you mentioned it earlier, I was like, oh, God, yeah, he wasn't. Oh, no, he's Saturday Night Live, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's on himself on Saturday Night Live, yeah. Yeah. Mm, okay. Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. 
fine, good Finally performance being again. Recognized mm. Oscar wise. It it feels a bit like, oh shit, we better chuck him a nomination <laughs> before he dies. Um it's probably why Glenn Close will win the uh, best yeah. actress. The- and and you know, Sam Elliott's great in this, don't get me wrong, but you know, Sam Elliott he, he's dependable, he's always great. Um, mm. but, then, uh, the, but the conflict between the two brothers kind of came out of nowhere and and then yeah. I liked that little moment where he just says something to him as he's driving away in the car and uh, and like just tell you by the way you know I've always you know you were very important to me I liked that in this kind of masculine like we can't really express our emotions so I'm just going to do this and that's that um, nice little moment uh, and I guess that's all you need for that for that subplot that's okay mm. We see this this character Ali, um, you know, become more and more successful. She's suddenly the big Ali thing, Pally. yeah. And and then we see her on this show, and she's kind of just doing this. She's gone from these very personal ballads, and like he's always saying, like you know, unless you've got something to say, no one's ever going to listen. You know, express yourself, express yourself. And then we see her doing these kind of just pointless pop crap. And he and he likes that, <laughs> but that's it. And he he kind of. I was thinking. I was thinking. What is um is, is are we supposed to think she's selling out? And then he sort of he sort of says to her, "Hey, you're selling out." But then she's like, "I must oh, admit, well, I didn't know up. how to take that." Yeah, I didn't know what the film was trying to. Yeah, again, that's just another thing we didn't really look at. Because there's an argument that what she's doing is still very much legitimate art. There's an argument that this is her art and he just perceives it a certain way. But there's also the argument that she's completely selling... Yeah, yeah, because she doesn't want the dancers. It's it's about her. and Yeah, Yeah. again, that's just another aspect that we didn't get into. Um, And we remember La La Land a few years ago had a very similar scene where Mm. um, the character was sort of almost selling out and there was a lot of nuance to it. I love that scene in La La Land. I thought it worked really well there. You kind of knew that the characters were all approaching it from a different angle, but the film wasn't necessarily coming down on it as, you know, selling out one way or the other. I Mm. I just didn't know how to take it here. I didn't know what the idea was. Um, I didn't think it was nearly done as well. Uh, Yeah, because I don't know what I don't know what the film's trying to say, and I don't think the film was saying, "Hey, this is a confusing situation. We have different opinions." It was, it was just a sort of like, "Oh, here's something else we can sort of throw in." I don't know well, what's happening. What, eh? I was going to say, I, I think the film is tonally very messy, and yeah. I think that's largely that the film isn't 100 percent sure what it's trying to achieve in a lot of places. I think another good scene is uh, to demonstrate that is when she's winning that award and then he goes up on stage and yeah. he's drunk. Just and really, yeah, very uh, broad, like a broad comedy I was gonna say, scene. It was. I was going to say, it's like a broad comedy sketch in the middle. I've spoken to people who think it's horrific, depressing drama and it's like, no, she she like holds up her dress to cover his piss-soaked pants. It's like, it's suddenly like slapstick comedy, whether or not it's intended a certain way. It just didn't play... Mm. Very well. It played for me. I, I thought it was. Yeah, I was cringing. I was very nervous. Uh, did James Mason do that in the Judy Garland version? I don't think he, he pisses get, himself. He gets well, drunk. He, does, he gets drunk and he embarrasses piss himself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's disappointing. He, I think he gets quite, you know, up on the mic and like, hey, let's all, hey, it's old timey drunk man, huh? Uh, because um, that was my first thought that came to my head when that happened. I was like, oh. I wonder if James Mason does that. I don't see James Mason piss himself on stage. The other, the other thing I want to address as well is the ending that we've talked about. But the whole suicide thing, I just think yeah. it would have been so easy to have this where he starts drinking again. He gets drunk and then goes in the car and he drives off. And then we find out he died in a car crash. But then that's, just have, have a sense, the original, have a sense of, of the implication. Films did that. Well, that's it. But have a sense of implication that maybe he was doing it deliberately. He was deliberately putting himself at risk. Did he slam himself into a wall? Was it? Was it? I just mean, I, I haven't seen it, but I think again, that's. I think that's how the which is, Judy Garland one, I which think, is the did that. which is the obvious way yeah. to do it because it, it gives you that just a little bit of ambiguity. But you know, his alcoholism is driven by self destruction anyway. We don't need to see that he wants to kill himself because that's that's what what he's doing the whole way through. Yeah. Mm. But to do it so deliberately, and then he's think- is he thinking that's going to help her? Because obviously it's going to completely derail her, like emotionally. Um, and again, we don't we don't we don't get into that. 
The fact yeah. that someone would kill himself and it was the wrong thing to do is, yeah, you can express that in a film, but we have to see why they're just, doing it. It's just fucking hack ending. It's like, oh, how do we? Oh, they kill himself. They die. Hmm. The clown hangs himself. The sad clown. <laughs> Gets up on the chair and puts his noose around his neck, and then a red, a woman in a red dress is in the window. Oh, yeah. I think, uh, to be honest, I think m- most of my problems with this film could be addressed if I felt like this was a couple in love and that I could believe that they would put up with certain things because of love, or not even because of love, this kind of nebulous concept, but because of a there is a healthy side to this relationship that we enjoy, and then yeah. this is an element that we put up with. Because people put cool. with shit in relationships all the time. Yeah, I think it did a very good job of portraying the, the, the sort of shitty sides of the relationship as well. It, it just mm. it needed some of the the more healthy, positive stuff. And I think you were meant to get that at the start, but then I just never bought the chemistry between them when you're meant to be getting any. Yeah, of that, yeah, so. I think so too. Yeah. Um. So yeah, should we should we rate it? Yeah. It's a nine from me. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I uh, I feel like I'm being extremely generous here, but you know, I, I, it's not. It's a film with some degree of merit. I, this is largely for the music and the performances, but I give it a six out of ten. What? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I felt I was. Was, being... was that a what? Like <laughs> you think? It well, should I be thought higher? you were sounding quite positive about it, so I'm just surprised. Well, but really, I've been complaining about how messy it is <laughs> and the, the ending not sitting well. <laughs> Yeah, I felt I, I think was. A, uh, yeah. I felt I was being quite positive as well. Uh, I gave it a four. Cool. Mm. Wow. Mm. And I, I'll say it's one of my. <laughs> it's not quite my least favorite film out of the uh, the batch out of everything nominated, but it's down at the bottom. Mm. It's one of my bottom three this year. So. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Calvin. Well, I'm so angry that I'm not going to stick around for the rest of this podcast. <laughs> I'm leaving. So, goodbye, gentlemen. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Just wait for this sound effect of a door slam. Sorry. Calvin's gone. We'll have to do the rest on our own. And now, last but not least, or is it least, eh? No. No. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, Vice. Now, this is... I was complaining about Bohemian Rhapsody being such a badly reviewed film to land a Best Picture nomination earlier. This hasn't fared much better. This has had very mixed reviews, and I think it's only got, like, two percent more on Rotten Tomatoes than Bohemian Rhapsody does. Mm. Um so I, I was really excited to see this film going in. Um this this was before Best Picture nominations had been announced. To be honest, I didn't think this film was gonna get a Best Picture nod. Mm-hmm. I only saw the big short for the first time last year. I'd mm-hmm. put off watching it for however long. And it really, really surprised me. I was not expecting yeah. as someone who is a fan of Adam McKay and has followed the career, not you know meticulously, but has passively followed his career. Uh, and I'm talking about films like Anchorman here, <laughs> Step Brothers. Um, <laughs> I was not expecting uh, very much from The Big Short. I thought it was going to be very similar to what I expected from Green Book. I thought it was going to be very blandly directed, straightforward drama, uh, kind of neutering everything about Adam McKay. And and to be honest, there's not a lot of... Adam McKay's directorial style, from what you can see in those other films, is let actors improvise for mm-hmm. a year, whittle it down to, you know, the funniest few minutes, chuck a musical number in halfway through because it's <laughs> funny. And that's kind of it. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, to, just to, to kind of go alongside that, I was, I was kind of excited to see this film as well because when I saw the poster, I thought it was uh, Chevy Chase playing Dick Chevy. <laughs> So you can imagine my excitement. <laughs> but but just to go along with what you were saying there, I hadn't seen The Big Short. So when I went to see this, 
It Have was... you seen The Big Short yet, or still not? Well, I went to see Vice, and it was quite a revelation, um, <clears throat> without giving too much away just yet. Off the back of that, I went and watched The Big Short, uh, okay. which is, you know, quite a response right, well, from me. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's do The Big Short first, then, because that's kind of a lead-in to this film in a lot of ways. Okay, this yeah. is very much the spiritual sequel to that film. I don't think that's wrong to say. In fact, I, I believe Adam McKay has referred to this as a... Um, I don't know if he's called it a trilogy or just a series, but I think he's called it um, part of his white men failing upwards uh, <laughs> trilogy, which is Anchorman, <laughs> The Big Short, and Vice. And he says they're spiritually all very connected. And I, I can see where he's coming from, as much as it's weird to kind of lump Anchorman in with them. So yeah, The Big Short, uh, the sort of film that was proof that Adam McKay could make quote unquote real films, real cinema. Mm-hmm. For anyone who hasn't seen it, it's a dramatization, a comedic dramatization of the uh, banking crisis, the 2008 mm-hmm. financial crisis. Well, I think I think comedic is probably a bit strong. Yes, it is funny, but it's it's designed to be a serious I've seen it called a comedy, and I would say it's a drama, but it does very much have a sense of humor. Oh, definitely. It's yeah, got definitely. A, a very playful sensibility about how it approaches stuff. But it reminded me of David Fincher, and old David Fincher. David Fincher from, like, Fight Club era. That sort of yeah. willingness to just kind of just do whatever is called for in the moment, regardless of how out there and weird it might be, in a way that might completely destroy any semblance of tone in a lot of films, but then weave it together in a way where somehow it is tonally fluid and, and makes complete sense yeah. and consistent. And Well, that was it. I mean, basically, because I saw The Big Short second, Vice was a bit more of a revelation and a bit more of like, oh, right. wow, I've never really seen anything like this before. Never mind from Adam McKay, but this was kind of new to me. It's it's different. I was, that was That's really what refreshing. I had from The Big Short, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think if I'd seen it the way around, obviously that would have affected that. But, but however, I do think when I watched The Big Short... It felt like Vice was kind of someone who'd done that once and learned a little bit from the experiences. Yeah. And it kind of smoothed it out a little bit. So the big short felt a little bit more ragged to me, not in a necessarily a bad yeah. way. Uh, but it, it felt a bit more like they were just throwing everything in. I completely agree. I would also argue that with that, the big short felt like it had more energy and more to say and what happened. Yeah, Vice energy, felt definitely a bit more, energy. Yeah. A bit more tired about... The whole, not t- that- tired is the wrong word, but it felt a bit more like... We've already done this before. And I don't just know. Quite... That could be deliberate, though. I think the big shot is fueled by cocaine. You know that that those people and that that energy. Whereas Dick Cheney is not. It's like that. Dick Cheney is mm. a sort of old slow man who yeah. doesn't talk very yeah. quickly. I think that's probably deliberate. What the big shot is lacking is a kind of central emotional story, a kind of a character in the middle. I would say yes, yeah, centrally. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very much an ensemble piece about multiple characters. I think it's just a, it's, a, it's a much bigger story you're trying to tell. And yeah. Because the, the the storytelling in Vice is also a very big story, but centered around one person. This is a story that's kind of chopped and changed around a lot of people. I think that made it more difficult to identify with. I will also say that now I've watched The Big Short, I still don't really understand how economics works or how that collapse <laughs> happened. Really? I thought I thought it did an incredible job of making it make sense and explaining it. It did it did a very it did a very good job, but it's such a it's such a complex, deliberately labyrinthine nonsense yeah. so that people can't understand it. They do a very good job of explaining it. And there's a real depressing kind of like it's just gonna happen again. It's just gonna happen again. I think the big short did a really remarkable job, though, of in- injecting some legitimate emotion into some of those little arcs, particularly the one with Steve Carell. Yeah. And I, I think there's less of that in Vice. There is an, F- uh, an attempt to kind of add a bit of emotion towards the end, but it, it doesn't quite play the same way. It's not quite as... But yeah, um, so Vice, I mean, should we, should we jump straight into this one then? Yeah. This is the one that's nominated. This is the... Yeah, a lot of people seem to be struggling with whether or not it's a comedy or a drama. Again, the director said, uh, Adam McKay himself has said he doesn't really see it as a comedy, but most people are calling it a comedy. I thought that it was tonally very consistent. I was quite happy with it. There's a level of comedy to it, but it were, it's kind of like the favourite. I think it, it, it kept it balanced all the way through. I was happy with that. I think it's tonally very consistent, but I can see how people are having a hard time categorising it. I just, I don't quite know why people are so... I don't know. I, I don't see why 
I I'm fine with a film walking a weird line between the two, and consistently it it walks within that same you know layer of the spectrum. But um, I think it's just you you often get films that are more firmly one side or the other. I think that's kind of yeah. I mean, really, what it is is a a a film with a very serious intent, but it's also kind of very satirical and snarky and mm-hmm. comedically so about it as it does it and playful in ways and so I think that's fine. It's just not an approach that a lot of people are yeah. used to, I guess. So <clears throat> I, I can see how it's kind of confusing people, but yeah, I, I mean, I must admit when I was like I said, I hadn't watched the big shot. So when I first went into this, it was and there's got this very distinctive style, very choppy. It's sort of pseudo documentary style. It's yeah, you know, you've got yeah. a, you've got an out of body narrator kind of thing going on. It's it was odd, and at first I was like, "What the fuck is going on?" It sort of didn't sit well with me. But very quickly, I just like, okay, I got into it. I kind of got into mm. the rhythm of it and the balance of it. So same, yeah, I same. Really, it was just a little bit kind of so different to the mainstream, and like I didn't because I hadn't really anticipated what was going into. It. Um, so actually, yeah, in, in the end, quite pleasantly surprised by something different which is always nice. Mm. But the, the, for me, the most interesting thing is obviously the central character, I think. Well, this, this is it. This is very much a, a character study. Oh, yeah. Um, which there aren't... We haven't really had one this year in mm. the Oscars, have we? I, Bohemian Rhapsody is arguably a failed character study. Uh, yeah. Green Book, I suppose, is a character study, but it's a kind of twofer, so it's not quite the same thing. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't classify that in the same way, no. But yeah, this is, uh, yeah, it's really all about this central character, um, who is, you know, generally considered to be evil <laughs> by yeah. by people at, at large, even the people who once supported him. Um, yeah. So I think in that, with that in mind, this is a very balanced, a very generous portrayal. I think mm. it really mm. goes to great lengths to show a human side of yeah. the reputation, you know. And you know, we we, we must say um, we are both saying that as you know, <laughs> um, biased liberals, I guess. Well, lefty did, liberals. Oh, <laughs> did you uh, did you stick around for the the mid credit sequence? Uh, I don't think so. Oh man, it. you ah, oh, you missed out. That was that might be my favorite part of the film. Well, what was it? Maybe I I, I, like I, I don't know why. I just had a hunch there was going to be a mid credit sequence, and there was. Sorry to interrupt, but Mark wanted to share something with everyone. Something's been bothering me this whole movie, and I just figured it out. The whole thing's liberal. It's got a liberal bias. Interesting. Does anyone else feel that way? One, two, three, four people. Yeah, go ahead. This, it's all facts, right? I mean, they had to have vet all this with a lawyer. How does that make it? What's, what's You would say that, that libtard. Quit. Okay, I'm sorry. So because I have the ability to understand facts, that makes me a liberal. Okay, mm-hmm. guys, let's just take it down. Mm-hmm. We probably notches, like okay? Hillary. Let's take it down a notch or two, okay? <laughs> okay, first of all, Hillary's not president. Okay, the, 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 the orange Cheeto that you hired right. is the president and he's ruining Trump the country the that you claim to love. He's shaking oh, shit down. Oh, 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 uh, the camera just sort of pans slowly away to like these two women sort of on the outskirts and one of them just says something like I'm looking forward to the new Fast and Furious and, like that's the end of the film I just found it really funny it's just very um, I really liked it I really like this film I, I, I mean yeah there's no point pretending I didn't I I really like this film um, we see people and what the things they do and we can kind of see these historical sort of facts as we know them and it builds up a reputation of someone but obviously that person is a human it's like you know adolf hitler still like you know played with his dogs and was like nice to his his um you know friends or whatever i don't know whether maybe he wasn't but you know um, know i mean like people are still humans but yeah but my my point is that i i really like that kind of looking at that and uh, because i think there's this sense of hitler's obviously a bit of an extreme example but like if you're if you're just a german guy and you've been brought up in the nazi youth and then you're put into a you're put into a a job in auschwitz and then you're just like oh yeah heard these people into to be murdered please you just do it and i think there's the sense of that people are evil you're a bit older than me so you probably never did but did you did you get that poem to read as part of your school syllabus we had a big book of poems in my year that we, we had to like 
Not one about Nazis, I don't think. There was one about, I think it was called Vultures or something, and it was about a Nazi officer who um, stops off to buy some sweets for his kids on the way home from work, because, mm. like, the smoke of dead bodies fills the sky, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was this complete... And then it compares him to, you know, a, a, a vulture caring for its young in the nest yeah. after it's, like, picked the meat off a dead carcass and stuff and it, it, it that's yeah i think people like to think they're the that that some people can be evil because it makes them think that they can't be if they were in that situation they wouldn't do that they wouldn't follow that order when in real reality 95 percent of people would and i i really like that i really like looking at that i think dick cheney is quite an interesting example because it's not like he was just put into a situation and asked to do something and responded he obviously worked to get into a situation and he yeah. kind of made conscious decisions to do things that would uh, make him money or get him power or whatever but would also yeah. result yeah. in the deaths of lots of people but i think my, my yeah my point is that i like this kind of the banality of evil and, and this kind of expression of a, a whole person so yeah it kind of played into that for me it was uh, just as a, a, a sort of mainstream example I remember when we watched the born legacy and i liked that the edward norton character in that who's like the head yeah. of the kind of government yeah. operation who's like when something gets leaked it goes like right we need to just kill all our agents in the field just shut them down and that means murder them right <laughs> and so yeah. and he's just like well that's what we need to do it's for we need to make that go away it's just this kind of coldness uh, because it's what needs to be done for this kind of bigger picture. And I think if you look at someone like Dick Cheney, that's what he's dealing with. He's thinking, Why, what's the bigger picture? But yeah, I, th- I, found, I found it all just very kind of interesting. I thought it was a great character study. Yeah, I, I, I agree completely. It's, it's one of the first times I think I've ever really watched a, a film... I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, one of the first times. The Big Short was similar, where I've watched a film that is a kind of historical reenactment. In fact, The Big Short isn't, because I don't really... I didn't have a clue about what was going on and what led to the financial crisis, so it was all news to me. Whereas... Well, no, I'm I'm quite clued up on American politics now, and I I was more, you know, I I knew who Dick Cheney was back when he was knocking around. I had a Mm -hmm. vague idea of what was going on. And yeah, I was like 13, 14, so it was quite a rudimentary one. But it's one of the first times I've watched a film that's been a dramatization of history that I remember living through, and that's that's been a quite interesting thing for me because I'm so used to watching films that are dramatizations of stuff that's very alien to me. Whereas, you know, I, I remember watching stuff here on the news and like, you know, Tony Blair's and the, the archive footage and, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it, it, it felt closer to home than a lot of films do in that regard. Uh, peppered throughout this film, I think, really, I think it's a, ho- a holdover from... Um, the big short, <laughs> and I get the impression a lot of these might have been cut because I, I know a musical number was cut. There, there are there are a few <laughs> little moments where the film just um, completely breaks with reality to do something quite absurdist and and like a skit almost to to portray something. And this feels like a continuation of in the big short. They would say right now to make this as interesting as possible and explain this boring thing, we're gonna have Margot Robbie in a bathtub. And yeah. she'd be like, well, g'day, mate. So uh, <laughs> here's our bank's work. So now he's going to short the bonds, which means to bet against. Got it? Okay. Now fuck off. Which I, I, I didn't particularly like in the big short. It felt, a, yeah, and... The first time it happened, I thought, this is cheap and tacky. Mm. Um, then as it went on, it was like, but they are really, really explaining these very complicated difficult concepts that i do kind of need to understand to get what's going on here and i didn't really get before so i i actually thought they were pretty great on the whole but they they clearly went into this like we'll do the same thing and i think the holdovers of that are alfred molina pops up as a waiter at one point good evening gentlemen uh tonight we're offering the enemy combatant whereby a person is not a prisoner of war or a criminal, which means, of course, that he has absolutely no protection under the law. We're also offering an extraordinary rendition where suspects are abducted without record on foreign soil and taken to foreign prisons in countries that still torture. Oh, that sounds delicious. We also have Guantanamo Bay, 
which is very, very complicated, but it does allow you to operate outside the purview of due process on land which isn't technically U.S. territory, but where we still do have control. And also we have a very fresh and delicious War Powers Act interpretation, which gives the executive branch broad powers to attack nations or people who it deems still possibly a threat. We have the fact that under the unitary executive theory, if the president does anything, it must be legal. <laughs> Which, of course, means you can do whatever the fuck you want. So, gentlemen, which would you like? We'll, uh, we'll have more. Excellent choice. Thank you. Like the Alfred Molina scene is a good example because it kind of does the same thing, but it, it disguises it within the narrative rather than going, hey, we're going to jump out and do this. Yeah. I like yeah. that. That was all. That's just the little bit I need to make that just round up and work for me. I thought it was actually yeah. quite a clever way to just get that in. And uh, you know, there's a few other moments like when they go all Shakespearean or when they have a, a credits yeah, fake yeah. out halfway through, and which worked for, all worked for me. I thought it was yeah, they fun. all work really well. Yeah. So yeah, you've got those odd little cameos in there. Then we've got uh, Jesse Plemons as the narrator. Yeah. Um, I like Jesse Plemons a he's lot. A, he's a great. I'm wait, I'm still waiting for him to do get a role that's really going to make him like, right, everybody knows who Jesse Plemons is now and he's just won an Oscar and all that. Feels like that's on the way. Do you know yeah, what I mean? No, I, I, like a, yeah, I, like a lead, I think it'll have to be for people to know who he is. Yeah, I mean, he, he's had a lot of great roles. He's done a lot of great bits of acting, but... Um, well, exactly, that's what I mean, but... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just, uh, he's not got that, that lead man. Well, he, he always reminds me of Philip Seymour Hoffman, actually. So, you know, that's, yeah, it looks like him, yeah. But that's well, he, okay. he, he played Philip Seymour Hoffman's son, didn't he, in uh, The Master? I mean, it makes sense. It looks like him. Good casting, isn't it? Yeah. So, then we have Tyler Perry, portraying oh, yeah, Colin yeah. Powell. Yeah. Again, very good. He's yeah. always a surprisingly good actor when he <laughs> when he pops up in non-Madea films. <laughs> yeah. Madea, I gotta go out of town. I was wondering if you can come by and just keep an eye on Tiffany. No, son, no, I can't come over there. It's Halloween night. You know I like to go nowhere on Halloween. I'll pay you. I'm on my way. I'll be there now. Alison Pill. Yeah, his daughter. Mary Cheney. I like Alison Pill a lot. Shay, Shay Wiggum plays his father-in-law. Drunk. Mm -hmm. Always turn up and stuff. Oh, fucking Eddie Marsan turns up. What is Eddie Marsan? Like, what's going on with his career? Like, why does he keep popping up in, like, two-minute roles in American films? And then he'll be in, like, a Shane Meadows film. <laughs> uh, Steve Carell as Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah, of course, yeah. Steve Pretty... Carell is, I think, one of the best actors working today. I think he's an incredible talent. Um, this is a very Steve Carell role, He's playing the way he's playing it. Yeah, not not his... Um, it was a very straightforward role that I didn't feel required all that much from him. Compared to, say, The Big Short, which I thought brought out a lot yeah, of, yeah. of subtlety and nuance and, and emotional stuff in him. This just felt like they dressed him up to look like Donald Rumsfeld and he kind of just... Like Michael Scott in the White House, basically. Yeah, like... <laughs> yeah. And then it, was, it was good, you know, but he didn't stand out to me in this cast particularly. And Amy Adams as Lynn Cheney was similar, to be honest, for me. Um, again, I think Amy Adams is great. I really like her a lot. She was fine. A totally solid performance from an actor who's usually reliable, so yeah. There's, there wasn't enough there for her to really do anything particularly special with it. I don't think it's down to her, it's just what, what the was. Yeah, so character's just not got that much to do. Like, there's a point where it feels like, oh, this is now her story's taking off, which is when um, she begins campaigning on, mm -hmm. on Cheney's behalf, because he's had a heart attack. Yeah. But then it kind of, pretty soon he's back up and running again, and it just... And like, yeah, she's she's good in it, but again, she's not one of the standouts for me. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Rockwell? Yeah. I love Sam Rockwell. I think, um, I think you're less convinced by him, generally speaking. <laughs> I thought he was fantastic here. I, I mean... <sighs> It's hard, it's difficult to say, because it's it wasn't... He's playing George W. Bush. I thought the makeup on him was incredible in that it just evoked George Bush without necessarily looking yeah. exactly like him. Um, yeah. you, it just, um, Which is how I think they approach the makeup in general in this film, and I think they did a wonderful job, generally speaking. But yeah, particularly noticeable on George Bush. I thought Sam Rockwell nailed him. I, I thought it was, again, this performance had a lot of subtlety and like depth to what he was doing. Uh he's not in it much. So you he's know he's barely in the film at all. A surprisingly thorough take on a kind of fun little <laughs> cameo performance really, if you know what I mean. It, it, yeah. 
I, I almost want to see the Sam Rockwell, George Bush movie <laughs> from Adam McKay afterwards, except, you know, I, I, I don't know if I actually, if there's enough there to make a decent film. But The, the problem with that character is that he's playing it pretty sort of straight, but it still feels like a comedy cartoon character. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, I don't know how accurate that is, but it just seems like that's what George W. was, you know? My, my, my understanding of Bush is that this is actually quite accurate, but it, like you say, it just it always feels tonally absurdist in a, in a way that kind of doesn't quite gel with the rest of the cast. But no, I really liked him in this, and I'm I'm very glad he's nominated for an Oscar because I didn't think he would be. I think it's just too small a role, frankly. But... That's that's it. That's <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, is there anyone else or Christian Bale? Should we Should we get to the yeah, big, let's the big guns? With the big the, the boy. Christian Bale again, another incredible, incredible actor. Turned out some incredible performances. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is this is a good one. Um, yeah. Not again. Not not the best acting I've seen from him ever. But that sounds like I'm saying. I I mean that in the most literal sense. Like I, it's not, <laughs> it's not the best performance I've ever seen from him. So I don't mm. want to champion it like it is. But it's very good performance. And I I gotta say I don't particularly like Christian Bale. I'm not gonna try and deny that he's a great actor and what he does. You know, it brings perform brings the character out. But he always comes across as. Christian Bale uh, is a wanker, you know? Like, there's always just this kind of, like, I bet yeah. he's a total prick. I um, can believe that. And that kind of taints everything he does for me. But Except it works here because he's playing <laughs> a horrible man. No, not really. Um, I think... I mean, I uh, no, don't get me wrong, I think this is a great performance. I also think that playing, like, a fairly emotionless sociopath is quite easy. I don't think I agree. he needs... To, I don't think he has to do much here. He does what he needs to do, and it's perfectly correct for the character, so I'm not questioning it. But it's not something that's going to show you as a great actor. It's not something that's really award-worthy, um, because the opportunities just aren't there. I think he does this to a high enough standard, and I, I think there are enough moments for him to show depth beyond just emotionless sociopathy, um, such as the whole interplay with his daughter. Mm-hmm. I think there is enough... Uh, going on with the performance here that I do I do think um, this is awards worthy completely again I think he's not only am I glad that he's nominated for an Oscar but I'm glad that he's one of the front runners and he's not my favorite performance this year but I think he's very good and he and he's definitely bolstered by again the makeup job on him the fact that he's mm. gained however much weight yeah, Dick Cheney had, had at any given moment in his life for whatever scene they're doing. Um, I mean, I don't know when he's going to stop the whole weight acrobatics. It, it's starting to feel a bit old now. It's, <laughs> it was a gimmick the first two times he did it, but now it's just like, this should never get to the point that it's just a standard tool in your repertoire, but it <laughs> is for him for some reason. Yeah, no, I, I think he's very good. Um, I, yeah, an all-round great cast. Long story short, I really, really like this film a lot. It's my favourite film of the nominated Best Picture films this year by a considerable amount. Uh, I'm going to have to make a slight amendment to my top 10 of 2018, in fact, to pop this in at number three and shift everything down accordingly. Um, Go and listen to our Diminisode to hear the others. (laughs) That that was a free Diminisode as well. You don't even have to join Patreon or anything. I know, holy holy shit. (laughs) This film hasn't like this film's been getting relatively mixed reactions, like siding on positive, but not overwhelmingly so. A lot of the backlash seems to be that it is a snarky film that preaches to the choir, mm-hmm. and I I think that's probably all true to an extent. It is a very snarky film, and it does preach to the choir. But like I'm in that choir, <laughs> and therefore I enjoy being preached to because that's why I go to church, you know. So. I loved it. I really enjoyed it, and I think it does what it sets out to do very, very well. So, yeah, it's an 8 out of 10 for me. Yeah, fair enough, yeah. I mean, I, I gave it 8 out of 10 as well. For me, it would be between this and Green Book in terms of my favourite of the nominees. I'm not sure which I would go for. Like, in terms of overall direction, this Vice is a lot more kind of inventive. It's more interesting. Mm. In terms of director, definitely. Uh, in terms of editing, yeah. it was. But in terms of actual just general... I feel like Green Book is a little bit too... It's nice, but it's perhaps a little bit too inconsequential. So yeah, I, I'm favoured towards Vice safe. just because it feels like in 20 years this will still be interesting. 
Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Although it would be less sort of politically uh, relevant. I would. Well, I don't know. Arguably more so. I, I, I love watching films deal with history and historical events from close to that time mm. as a little time capsule of, and and you know, obviously this is ten years on, but. Um, 15 years on, or however long, but I think that could be more interesting than ever. That, that's why Godzilla, the original Godzilla, is such an interesting relic, mm. because it's dealing with the fact that Japan had just been bombed, uh, nuclear bombed, um, very directly. That That's why... <laughs> Did you just... Was that a Bond, James Bond joke? Bond, <laughs> <nuclear> bomb? <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't, sadly. <laughs> I, I love nuclear war movies, and I particularly love the ones that were made during the Cold War because it's mm. like a real artifact of what people were feeling at the time. Yeah, I know um, what you mean. Yeah, I would like, like, I would like to see a film about you know Harry Truman's vice president, but then I'd want to yeah, see the, f- yeah. but then a film that was made of that in the sixties would be very different to a film made of that now. I'd exactly, like to see yeah. both because then I'd like to exactly. to see the different historical context at play yeah i know what you mean yeah yeah but i i th- i'm definitely i'm definitely interested to see what adam mckay does next oh i am well you know he was uh you know what he was being courted for uh avengers 3 oh you are so close <laughs> something more you comedic are so something more close comedic, then. are you aware james gunn was fired from guardians of the galaxy oh, 3 oh right yeah 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 uh, yeah, Marvel were courting him very heavily for that, and I, th- I believe he turned it down. But obviously, he worked on Ant Man, so they've got ties with him because he, he kind of shepherded it for that brief period between Edgar Wright and uh, oh, right. Peyton Reed, and has a screenplay credit on it. I think um, I think he is working with Marvel on on a lesser known thing actually, but whether or not he's going to end up directing it, and certainly whether or not it's going to be next, who knows? I think he'll probably do something not superhero-y, personally. I think it's interesting to see someone really reinvent themselves stylistically. Yeah, yeah. And completely. then another film that is kind of the same. <laughs> so it'd just be interesting to see uh, what he'll do next if he tries to just mm. keep reinventing or try to be new or just do you know what thing. I but I think he actually just signed I, I, I think he actually signed on to do something like I think it was announced a few days ago and I'm, yeah um, I don't know if this is officially green lit but supposedly his next film is something called Bad Blood um, is it about which is... AIDS in the eighties <laughs> maybe <be. laughs> it's, not, it's not a joke I mean, it could have been. Uh, it's about uh, an entrepreneur creating a biotech company that um, ends up being valued like insanely well and worth billions, and then they investigate the company and their integrity is called into doubt. I believe it is yet another real-life yeah. biopic thing being adapted, so it does sound like he's sort of set into um, specific mould at the moment, and he's just going to do this sort of thing. Probably till he wins that Oscar, and then he'll probably go back and make <laughs> Command 3 or something with Will yeah, Ferrell. Um, so that is our our uh, best pictures. Do Can you give us a, a rundown, the actual full ratings list? Do you want them from worst to best, best to worst? How do you want this? Well, we've already, yeah, let's do worst to best. Makes more sense that way. All right, so our ranking is uh, worst one this year, Roma. We've given that 50, 50%. Yep. Five out of 10. Second place, Bohemian Rhapsody, 55%, 5.5. Yeah, that's probably fair. Yeah. Then third place, uh, A Star is Born, 6.4, 64%. Calvin won't be happy with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, but he, he skewed that massively up. <laughs> so he did. So he did. He, he did all he could. <laughs> Um, then we've got fifth place, The Favourite with 70%, 7 out of 10 but only two of us rated on it which is why it's below the joint third place 7 out of 10, 70% from Mm. Black Klansman and Black Panther and then joint first for us is Green Book and Vice, so interesting Mm. okay, so let's have a quick chat about the other categories then so Mm -hmm. Lead actor this year, actor mm-hmm. in a leading role. We've got Bradley Cooper from A Star Is Born. No, Doesn't nonsense. deserve to no, even no. be nominated. No, not, 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 a particularly, not even a particularly good performance. It felt very... Well, it felt, he's fine. It felt lacking in direction as well, it obviously, yeah. <laughs> for a reason. I think he's fine in it, but I don't think he deserves to be nominated at all. No. Uh, Willem Dafoe at Eternity's Gate. 
I haven't seen it. I can believe he's as good as people are saying, which is very, very good. That's like the uh, outside one where it's a great performance in a film that nobody cares about yeah. or has seen, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There's always one. Rami Malek and Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, that's um, fair. He's good, yeah. but it's kind of is that classic thing of always playing a real person who's dead. <laughs> I would argue with that. And that a physical he... transformation. Yeah, I would argue with that, that he really brings a lot to it. I think he brings... Uh, it's a very emotional character as well, as opposed to, say, Dick Cheney. I think... I think the film maybe doesn't ever try to dig into mm. any of that emotion enough for him to really get to show it. Yeah, um, yeah. It, 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 I think the portrayal of Freddie Mercury in that film is similar to what you were saying about um, Dick Cheney and Vice, an, an almost emotionless sociopath. Uh, that's not quite fair but he, he does feel very devoid of human emotion in that film it's just kind of like occasionally they'll go all right well i guess you have to um do a look do a sad face in this one yeah i, I, I don't know I, I think you can tell that remy malik's capable of it i think it oh been, I, it yeah it would have been I, lovely to see a good film i think it's a shame that he wasn't in a better film because he, he's definitely got the talent and like i think he deserves a nomination don't get me wrong he is good uh then we've got christian bale and vice who we just spoke about Viggo mortensen and green book that we just spoke about so my favorite here Viggo mortensen i think he's by far the best of this lot I don't really have a clue who's going to win this one. It could be almost any of them. If if Bohemian Rhapsody was even remotely good, I would go with Rami Malek. Uh, I think he's got a very good chance at winning, but I also yeah. think Christian Bale has a very good chance of winning. I think there's probably a sense of... Christian Bale's won things before, he'll do great yeah, performances again, awesome. whereas Rami Malek feels a bit more like, oh, this is his big thing, so let's give it to him. Yeah, You know what I mean? I feel like Christian Bale, we're kind of used to it now. We don't really care as much. My money would be on Rami Malek. Uh, so, lead actress. We've got Lady Gaga, Star is Born. I think Olivia Colman, yeah. the favourite. She's his lead, lead actor. It's interesting. I know. I would have called her a supporting role. Mm. And I would have probably called Emma Stone the lead, personally. But um, It feels like it's Emma Stone's journey. That that's, that's in terms journey, yeah. of who's a protagonist, yeah. Uh, so, then we've got Yalitza Aparicio uh, from Roma, two that none of us have seen, Glenn Close and the Wife and Melissa McCarthy, Can You Ever Forgive Me? I think the favourite here, the bookie's favourite, is Glenn Close and the Wife. Well, Cal- Calvin's definitely of the opinion that it's her turn and they're going to just give it to her because it's about time. I mean, I'd give it to Lady Gaga, and I think she's got a very good shot at it. Again, I, I think it's between those two, mm. and it could go either way. But yeah, I mean... I think Lady Gaga might have an element of that same up-and-comer. She's definitely going to act again. I don't know if she's ever going to quite She's never going to be have nominated a for an award that's... again, yeah. In then quite that same way, yeah. But then Glenn Close, maybe it is. A t- I don't know. We'll, we'll, <clears throat> we'll see. All right, supporting actor. Uh, Adam Driver, Black Klansman, Mahashala Ali, uh, Mahashala Ali Green Book. <laughs> That wasn't me doing, like, a hack bit of comedy. I just actually fucked it up. Uh, Richard E. Grant, Can You Ever Forgive Me? Sam Elliott, A Star Is Born. Sam Rockwell Vice. I think that's a slam dunk for Mahashala Ali, personally. In terms of who deserves it. The only upset I could see is if someone decides it's Sam Elliott's time. I don't think he's won an Oscar before, has he? Could be, yeah. That could be right. I don't, Mahashala Ali didn't blow me away in that either. Do you know what I yeah, mean? It's like it, it, it no, was. I, agree. A, I think he's a good actor. I'm happy with him there. It's a nomination. And I'm happy didn't with. they didn't they hand him an Oscar for like barely doing anything a few years ago <laughs> for Moonlight? <laughs> yeah, I reckon. Yeah, I reckon like old uh, Mustache Man might might be uh, might be the one. Yeah, it might be the year right. for giving just giving out some to the old classics like Glenn Close and. What about Richard E. Grant? Actually, I mean, I haven't seen that film. I, I think, guess I think that's the problem that they've, no one's seen the film. Yeah. <laughs> um, supporting actress: Amy Adams, Vice, Emma Stone, The Favorite, Rachel Weisz, The Favorite, mm-hmm. Marina de Tavira, Roma, yeah, Regina King, If Beale Street Could Talk. I think that is completely and utterly a toss-up between Emma Stone and Rachel Weisz. Yes. No, and right. I would go with Emma Stone, but. A lot of people seem to like Rachel Weisz, and maybe it's her year. I don't know. Has she ever won an Oscar? Because Emma Stone's definitely got... got... Um, she's been nominated. Uh, she was nominated for The Constant Gardener in 2005, but she didn't win. Oh, yeah, of course. Whereas Emma Stone won for La La Land yeah. and was nominated for The Help. I don't know if she won that year. Mm. I don't think she did. I think, yeah, again, it might just be like, hey, you know what? It's, it's her turn. Like Emma Stone's had one, she'll have more. Let's give what to Rachel Weiss while we've got the chance. 
Mm. Directing, like it's it see this is such a tough year to call because there really is no clear obvious winner for anything this year. Like there there usually is a more obvious narrative around the films mm. and you kind of know who the front runner is. Directing, it's Adam McKay for Vice, Alfonso Coron for Roma, Spike mm-hmm. Lee Black Klansman, mm-hmm. Yargos Lanthimos the favorite, Powell Paulikowski for Cold War, which is a, um, I think, French film that we haven't seen. Outsider. So, I mean, he's got no chance. I cannot see Yargos Lanthimos winning. No. I cannot see Adam McKay winning. I, I would probably choose Adam McKay, but I can't see it. I can't see it happening. It would probably be my choice. Though. I mean, for me, for, personally, he would be my pick of those five, easily. That's what I mean. I, I think that's what I'm saying. I would think I would probably pick yeah. that. Spike Lee... Never won an Oscar. Well, is it is is it Spike Lee's year? He's never been. This is the first time he's ever been directed, uh, ever been nominated as best director. I think no. I think the film is simply not good enough. I agree. I I just cannot quite see them. I think the fact that he's nominated is a bit of a a bit of a um a, a kind of a nod to a, 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 his career rather than this particular film. To be perfectly honest, and I think Spike Lee will. There's a good chance he'll have another shot at. A directing Oscar. Yeah, Spike Spike Leal wins with something really kind of serious, you know? Did he win for that documentary about the the little girls and the fire and all that? Uh, no, I know. But don't. anyway, like something like that I can see him winning. But I guess my money here's on Alfonso Coran. Yeah. But, feels a little bit I don't know. That's like a winner by default. <laughs> yeah. I agree. But I think there's enough there's enough elements there. Mm. that shows great direction, even if I don't yeah. like the whole thing. I mean, I'm not intending to go through every single category here, but some of these are really interesting. So original screenplay, we've got uh, Vice, Roma, The Favourite, Green Book, and First Reformed. Do you know First Reformed? No idea. It's Paul Schrader, that was... Pe- it is Paul pedigree. Schrader, yeah, exactly. Paul Schrader, who, who like you say, is a, a pedigree, but kind of... <laughs> 40 years ago. ...fell out of <laughs> favour with... Hol- yeah, I mean... His last few films have been like barely getting theatrical release Lindsay Lohan exploitation vehicles from what I've seen. Mm. But I, I've heard a lot of people call this like the best film of, you know, the year and, and stuff like that. It, it's kind of, I think it's a bit too low budget and gritty and small to really ever have a real chance, but mm. it's an interesting thing to see nominated. I reckon Green Book's going to win that. I think of all the stuff Green Book could win that's probably going to be the one i think you're right that is the cleanest screenplay of the lot yeah i think vice is arguably more innovative and i would go with vice for that reason the favorite's weird and off kilter and not particularly well structured story-wise roma is so naturalistic that it's almost like they just improvised a film it's not i mean not quite but it's yeah I think you're right. Uh, and then adapted screenplay, we've got Star is Born, which I think has no no place here, but fair <laughs> enough. Black Klansman, Can You Ever Forgive Me, uh, which we haven't seen. If Beale Street Could Talk, which we haven't seen, uh, you probably would like, because it's the Moonlight Man. Mm-hmm. And The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is the Coen Brothers Netflix film, which I... Well, which I haven't watched, watched yet, yeah, but I saw it on Netflix the other day, yeah. I honestly have no idea what's going to win there. Now, bear in mind, I've not, I don't really know much about it, but Can You Ever Forgive Me? It's been nominated for a few different things, got in those acting categories. A bit of acting. There must yeah. be something good about it. So this is the sort of one that get. This is the one that it'll win when it's a film you don't really know. Yeah. My, my guess is, from what I've heard, I think The Ballad of Buster Scruggs is probably a bit messy. It was originally written as a TV series before being edited into a mm. movie. As shot and written, I should say, but in the edit room, they changed their mind. So I cannot imagine that that's a um the best screenplay there a star is born yeah it's just not even if you're a big fan of that film it's not because of the writing it's surely it's you know it's so naturalistic again black clansman as much as i enjoyed it you're right it's just not quite at that level so i think you might be right there i could see it being either that or if beale street could talk uh let's look at cinematography as well i guess that's quite a big one star is born i I just don't get it Cold War, which apparently is beautiful and incredibly well shot, but I haven't seen. Never Look Away, another foreign film, probably lovely, no idea what it looks like. The Favourite, we've already spoken about the cinematography there, and Roma, 
Uh, that is a slam dunk for Roma. Roma's going to mm. win that one, mm. hands down, no question. What about song? You like the songs? What about that? Well, let, let's look at the score. So, original score is an interesting one because Isle of Dogs is in there, mm. which very deservedly so. I, I didn't expect it to actually get recognition, but if you remember our review of the year episode, I chucked a clip in and a little quiz. And yeah, it's a great bit of composing. Um, Black Panther again, great score. Really glad it's in there. Mary Poppins Returns, I, I mm, don't know about the score there, but whatever. Haven't seen if Beale Street could talk. Black Klansman, the music didn't really pop out at me. So, I mean, any of those could win. I could see that going... I could see that going to Black Panther, honestly. Or if Beale Street could talk. An Isle of Dogs, I think, is just perhaps the most worthy of the lot in terms of who's nominated. I just can't see it being recognised properly. Yeah, it's not really my area, yeah. Not so uh, original song. I mean, it's going to be A Star Is Born Shallow. Again, that's that's foregone, done deal. And I'd say rightly so, out of the nominations. That's the one I'd give it to. Uh, animated? You've seen Incredibles 2 and Spider-Man, right? I haven't seen the Spider-Verse film. Oh, you've not, have you? Uh, I saw I Love Dogs. I haven't seen Ralph Bricks the oh. Internet. I mean, I, I liked I liked I Love Dogs in a sense. I mean, it was just Wes Anderson doing his thing. And it was just yeah, not yeah. a massive fan of Wes Anderson. Um, I haven't seen Mirai, which is the other nominee, mm. an anime thing. It feels like Spider Verse is going to get that. I think it is. Just because I it, think it is more. It's not just a kids' entertainment film. It was, it was a bit more innovative, wasn't it? Yeah. Like like I've said before, I think Incredibles two is my preference of the two films. But I want Spider Man to win it because it was more innovative. It was really fucking innovative from an animation point of view, as in the actual look and feel of the film. And um, it was such a kind of creative stab in the dark that film that paid off I, i'm so i think it needs to be rewarded for taking risks you know yeah so right well there's best picture so who do we think is going to win out of the best picture nom- noms who do who do who do, we, who do i think is going to win well black clansman i've seen some people tip that is most likely to win no i just don't I don't think it will. I think that was a real... That was, like, one that snuck in at the back. That, like, it's not quite... It's not really competing, you know? Mm-hmm. Is would be my... And I might regret saying that, because it's competing more than a lot of films that aren't really competing. It would be um, a nonsense of that one, yeah. Yeah. Black Panther, I get... Like, I've spoken to people who are adamant this is going to win, but no, it won't. It nah, this isn't the won't. year for, for that, no. It's, it's, in, it's mad enough it's been nominated, and, like, yeah... There's no way, no way. It's there's, like it's lucky to have been nominated at all. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, same thing. Snowball's chance in hell. It shouldn't be there. It's not good enough to be in the nominee, even. No. The favorite. Early on, I thought the favorite might win it, but that was before I watched a load of the other films and things developed. And it, I don't know. I mean, it could still be an outside. I can't see it. It's just a little I think bit it's just too, too quirky weird, and counterculture to. To quite yeah. to just yeah to to get all get everyone behind it yeah. I if it happens, I won't be completely surprised, mm. but I mean, I'm not counting on it. Green Book is, I think, the bookies' favorite at the minute. Really? Certainly one of them. It won. It's won all the like producers' guild um, awards and things like that that are usually a good sign as to who's gonna win. Of course, The Big Short won a load of those and didn't win Best Picture how many years ago that was. That like in, in recent years, that's become less of a good predictor. But yeah, Green Book is one of the favourites. And I, and I see why, but it's very safe. And I think it's perhaps too safe. Well, to keep bringing it back to Driving Miss Daisy, I feel like, yeah, if this film was made in 1991, I would say there's a good chance. I think it's just a bit too kind of not biting enough um which is in in what way is why i liked it but i just i agree except i just don't think there's anything else obviously you know up against it this year uh, this is why i could see it winning um then we've got roma this could win it again this could win it 
I mean, it could. I just can't believe that a lot of people are calling this the favorite. It's basically between this and it Green might Book. be the critics' favorite. But there's plenty of people voting who aren't. Well, yeah, Bo- the fact that Bohemian Rhapsody got nominated this year suggests maybe we're not going to see people voting for Roma. I think there's too many people who are going to turn Roma off after 20 minutes. <laughs> just like fuck that. I might be completely wrong here, but I believe the Oscars use that method of ta- uh, counting votes, whereby you ch- you choose like a favorite and then a second favorite and then like a yeah. third favorite, and it they like eliminate mm-hmm. films and add up all the stuff. And I think as a result of that, there's going to be people who like Roma who put it at number one, and then there's going to be people who don't like Roma who do not put it in there. Like they'll put it right at the bottom. It's you not going to get many second places. Yeah. So yeah. I could see that costing it. That's interesting, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'll bear that in mind. That, that that knowing that knowing that, that will play to Green Book's exactly favorite, knowing that know. system would say Green because Green Book's going to be a lot of second third favorites. Yeah, because there's yeah, nothing in my there. To, there's nothing there to dislike about it. Whereas, yeah, yeah. You know, whereas like say Roma is going to turn. It's not my second favorite. What am I talking about? Black Panther's my second favorite. Uh, <laughs> Green Book's my third favorite mm. of those. Uh, a Star Is Born, I think, is still. A while ago, this was the front runner. For a little while, it felt like it was going to just slam its way through the Oscars. It hasn't been nominated in as many categories as people thought. It feels like people have gone off it a bit, maybe because more people have started watching it and realised it's not actually very good. I think it's still in the running. I think it could take take I'm the win. Like, I think it's going to win just because it's the one I don't like, and history tells me that that means it'll win. Um, because well, you you loved Moonlight just two Oscars ago. I know, but I'm talking about the things that I don't like about this, and the sort of things that people like, and it, it's you know what I mean. It's it's this feels like it's gonna tick boxes for people mm. because mm. they're stupid. And again, that second third place, yeah, yeah, uh, and then Vice. Again, mm. I just th- I think Vice hasn't got a snowball's chance in hell, sadly. It's too divisive, I think. Yeah, I think it's the best one of the lot, but it's cynical and snarky in a way that turns a lot of people off. A lot of people struggle with the tone. Oh, is, am I meant to be laughing, or is it serious? <laughs> well, who knows? Who knows? I'm not... I, if I have to pick, I'm going to say... I'm, I'm going to go with A Star Is Born. Ooh. But I, it, could, it could be... It could be that, it could be Green Book, it could be Roma... I think any three of those, any of those three are like very firmly poised. The favorite fourth, most likely after them. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody at the very back. <laughs> mm, I think if I was going to put money on it, it'd probably be A Star Is Born. Mm. Depend on the odds, though. If I could get better odds on Green Book, I'd take it. Do you want me to look? Do you want me to? In fact, I think I've got the bookies page up in a tab here. I've got four to one on Green Book here. Star Is Born. Whoa! Star, Bo- Star Is Born is thirty-three to one. I've got Tom Hiddleston five to two next James Bond. <laughs> yeah, that's there as well. Wow, Star is born thirty three to one. Vice a hundred to one. Oh, Jesus. Roma is I don't know what that is in a fraction because I have mine on decimals. Roma, <laughs> for, I've got Ro, Roma's four to seven. I'm gonna put a bet on right now. I'm gonna do it live on the show. I'm gonna have Green Book and a Star is born because the odds are just too good to. Wow, though I mean they are fucking yeah. A Star is born below Black Panther on here. That's insanity. I've got the best supporting actress odds. Regina King is odds on favourite. Really? So that's the one we haven't seen. Oh, okay. I mean, I can believe that. Uh, yeah, they've got Glenn, Cl- Glenn Close down. Is, uh, they've got Olivia Coleman above Lady Gaga for lead actor. I might put some money down on Lady Gaga then. I've got, yeah, Lady Gaga 10 to 1. I've got that. 10 to 1. Nice. Man, I'm, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna clean up on it. <laughs> Chris, Christian Bale 2 to 1 seems pretty fucking good honestly such an likely i think he's very likely to win that even though i i probably will go to rami malik fucking hell 16 to 1 on emma stone mahashala ali for supporting actor then richard e grant yeah we kind of overlooked him but i i you know talking to people i think richard e grant is actually in the running here yeah wow they've got black Klansman as the favorite for adapted screenplay yeah, yeah. you know yeah if those, if can you ever forgive me? Isn't that well written? Because we haven't seen it. I... All right, I'll, be sorry, I'll tell you what bets I'm, I've put on, and we can all, all right. share <laughs> uh, live on air. I'm putting bets on. Okay, I, I, basically, I'm going for some kind of not the favourites. Green Book, Best Picture, and A Star Is Born, Best Picture. Okay, leading actress Lady Gaga, a ten to one. I think that's very, very, very generous odds. Best supporting actor, I'm going with Sam Elliott, bit of an outside one, twelve to one. But I, you know, as we just talked about, just a, there's an outside chance there. I'm going best original screenplay, 
for Green Book. Just for best foreign film, because it, Roma is massive favourite, but like you say, because it's been nominated for best picture, it might just get missed over. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going with the second choice, which is Cold War, which is the one that seems to be getting a lot of attention. So six to one, that's just a little outside bet. So that's it. Yeah, I've got seven yeah. bets on. Uh, no, I've not got six bets on too. Right, so that is the 2019 Oscars special. Uh, thanks to Calvin for coming in for part of it. Um, oh! <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> that's all he has to say. Uh, yeah, let us know uh, what you think is going to win the Oscars. If you put a bet on, let us know. Uh, we'll compare proceeds at the end. <laughs> but my, I'm deliberately going for the out, outside choices. I might not win any. And if you win, then you can use that money to support us on Patreon. <laughs> or, look, if you're going to put a quid or, on yeah. on a bet, you could just give us, like, 75p or whatever a dollar is and and keep 25p. Yeah, instead of wasting it on gambling, you'd feel yeah. addict. Yeah, do that. Patreon.com forward slash Dim Returns. We're putting up uh, mini episodes or the minisodes all the time and um, pretty much uh, like any film we see we'll review it and all sorts of other extra stuff going on there as well I mean yeah our patrons heard about half of this episode yes. two weeks ago pretty yes. much didn't they because we put it up early the stuff with Calvin was edited ahead of time there'll be more the minisodes out by the time this episode drops but currently we've put four up I think and mm. yeah more on the way trying to get out as many as we can yeah go, go check it patreon.com forward slash dim returns okay bye <laughs> see you bye. next time <laughs>